Happy Sabbath, everyone. I am so excited to be presenting again this week, Decolonizing the Black Adventist Mind, Part 2, by yours truly, Dr. Sidney Freeman, Jr. I am so excited to share this platform with so many of you. Uh, it is my prayer that people leave enlightened, inspired, and that their hearts and spirits are set free as a result of this broadcast. I would now like to introduce our distinguished panelists. So our first panelist is Pastor Mich Michelle Mota. Pastor Michelle Mota is a Bronx, New York born pastor and, and of Dominican heritage born into a pastoral family of Curcio and Laoda uh, Mota. She's going to correct me with, with the way I'm pronouncing this, uh, these names. Uh, she has held many job titles inside and outside of the church, including fitness coach, auditor, and even legal secretary, but none she is more prouder than being the first commissioned female pastor in the Southwest Region Conference. She has served as pastor for a three church district in Houston and is currently serving as the assistant pastor of the Frondren Seventh-day Adventist Church in Missouri City, Texas. Welcome, Pastor Moda. Next, we have Pastor Lawrence Souffrant. Pastor Souffrant is the founder, pastor of the Friday Experience a non-denominational fellowship that focuses on free thinking that promotes higher living. He is married to the beautiful Abina Souffrant. They have five children together. Next, we have Miss Claudia M. Allen. Uh, we're glad to see you, Pastor Souffrant. Uh, next, we have Miss Claudia uh, uh, Marion Allen. Uh, Miss uh, Miss Claudia is the online content manager at Message Magazine. Most recently, she completed the certificate program in theology and racialized policing with Sojourners and the Howard University Divinity School. She is a public speaker and writer on race, anti-racism, and biblical social justice. Who is a contributor, contributing author? Excuse me to the recent publication, Preaching Black Lives Matter by Reverend Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart. She is excited about her forthcoming book, Activate, Finding the Savior in Social Justice, a book that is birthed out of her passion to activate the activists in all of us. Next, we have Pastor Jeremiah Sapolin. Pastor Sapolin resides in Atlanta, Georgia. He received a BA in theology from Oakwood University and a MDiv in Global Studies from Liberty University and is preparing to defend his dissertation, congratulations, man, uh, for the Doctor of Intercultural Studies from uh, Fuller Graduate School. His doctoral research is on the relationship between indigenous North American spirituality and social activism. In 2010, he married the former F uh, Fabiola uh, Camara, their union is uh, their union has been blessed with two wonderful children, Jaden, age seven, and Annalise, who is six. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Tyron Douglas, aka Dr. Ty. Uh, Dr. Ty is an author, international speaker, consultant, professor, and pastor. He is a tenured associate professor of the Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis uh, at, uh, Program at the University of Missouri. He is also a CEO of O'Shea Group LLC and pastor of a community outreach and civic engagement uh, at the Salt City Church. The author of, he is the author of numerous scholarly articles and five books. And uh, before, before, the uh, the program is over. We'll mention a couple of his uh, couple of his books that will be uh, will be good resources for those who are are listening. 
Uh, I want to thank each of you for agreeing uh, to share your insights with us today. Uh, additionally, I would like to thank Kirk Nugent and uh, Composition for facilitating the audio visual uh, needs for this program. And I, I have to always give my wife a shout out for her support uh, in this venture. So before we move uh, further, I would uh, ask that our viewers share this presentation with your friends, family and loved ones on face uh, on your Facebook page. Uh, or for them, the YouTube link, or feel free to share directly from my website, which you'll see uh, see on, on the screen, which is Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. dot com. But before we go any further, we want to start out with prayer. So I would ask uh, Pastor Michelle to uh, to lead us in prayer. Sure, absolutely. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to have these conversations for the spaces and the places that you have opened at this time for us to be able to dialogue and really just get to the bottom of what it is that you have called us to do, even in a time such as now. So I pray right now for each panelist, God, that you would open their minds, that you would open their hearts and in reciprocation of that also open their mouths to speak your truth. And I pray, God, that these words that we speak today would not fall on deafening ears or ears that are not inclined to hear God, but people that are willing and able and desiring to know what it is that they need to do to move forward as a people. Bless us and keep us Father today. And bless Sydney as he leads us in this discussion. In your name we do pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, and just, be, just some housekeeping before, I, before we will begin. I have several questions that we will um, will help us to get started, uh, but then I will uh, will be consistently looking kind of at the chat, uh, the chat and uh, comment functions between both uh, Facebook and YouTube, and we'll try to address as many questions uh, as we can. Uh, after we get to the halfway mark, we'll take. Uh, well, when we get to the, kind of the halfway mark, uh, we'll take a, a commercial break, uh, after which we will then take even more questions from uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, feel, please, again, feel free to enter your questions in the chat uh, function uh, on YouTube and in the comments on Facebook. So before we, we go into our main questions for today, uh, I want to be sure that that we are on the same on the same page with re with regards to the term black. So I did this at the last one, uh, but we may have some new audience members and we want to make sure that we're we're all on the same page as it relates to that. So in the context of this this discussion, it means uh, anyone from the diaspora. So that may, you could be Afro Latinx, you could be uh, Afro Caribbean, you could be African American, you can be Af Afro Asian, uh, but we are all inclusive as it relates uh, as it relates to um, uh, black in that in that respect. Uh, there's also um, a different a, a definition around uh, colonization that I know that. Uh, uh, some of our panelists will address, but there has been robust conversation about uh, what the term sovereignty uh, means. And so uh, in the context of this discussion, uh, sovereignty uh, sovereignty uh, will will mean will mean that uh, that it will be uh, led and uh, operated and essentially it would have ownership by uh, the group of individuals uh, that we're talking about. And in this context, we're talking about black people. And so sovereignty, uh, sovereignty uh, uh, would, would mean that. So I look forward to having a robust discussion, uh, discussion and a thank you again to our panelists uh, for their willingness to participate. So I'm gonna throw out this question first and uh, I'll, I'll start out with Dr. Douglas. What does decolonizing the Black Adventist mind mean? And is it important? 
Uh, so first, good afternoon to everyone, and Dr. Freeman, thank you for this convening. Uh, I'm so excited to be on. Um, this is uh, a great conversation. I'm excited about uh, this, this definition and reflection on what does decolonizing the black Adventist mind mean and why is it important? Um, so I think one of the things that we have to first consider is what is colonialism? What does it mean to colonize? I want to just, just share a definition for some foundation. Uh, and it reads here, it says that to colonize is to send a group of settlers to a place and establish political control over. That's one definition, all right? Let me read that again. To establish or to send a group of settlers to a place and establish political control over it. Another definition says come to settle among uh, and establish political control over the indigenous people of that area, right? So I think it's important before we think about what we're trying to, un what we're undoing or, or the process of undoing, we need to also think about what was the doing that happened first. And so right. um, th the decolonization process is, uh, for the Adventist mind, is vital because I uh, Seventh-day Adventist, and I believe it's vital that we also connect to last week's panel or, or the, the first panel, which created a great foundation, uh, shout out to those who are on, where they highlighted the reality that the Adventist movement, the Adventist church, is a distinctly uh, American in its origin, an American Eurocentric product. And so as it was exported to various parts of the globe, and in particular for this conversation, the diaspora, we have to understand that it came with Eurocentric undergirdings, trappings, commitments, and let's be even more specific, grounded in white supremacy, which is uh, the DNA of the United States. And so uh, to undo that, to decolonize uh, the Adventist or the black Adventist mind is to begin to reflect on what uh, are uh, the, the infringements that have taken place on our psyche, our, our spirituality, our understandings of who God is and who we are in that context and to begin to reimagine what it could mean to perhaps be free from some of those accoutrements that have been suggested that that is the only way, uh, when in part and, and often in whole, it has been the way of, uh, of, of whiteness, of white supremacy. So I believe this is vital, yes, to answer the question explicitly. It's vital that we engage a process of decolonizing the black evidence mind, but it first starts with considering the fact that we have been colonized. And I'll be, um, I'll be, uh, I'll transition with this. I think it's important to think about space. The definition talks about space and place, right? So colonization is not just some, you know, you sort of ubiquitous term of, of, of everywhereness, but it's, it's geographically and geopolitically bound in that it plays out differently from jurisdiction to jurisdiction while it still has the same fundamental roots of white supremacy. So I, I need to be clear with you that I'm actually uh, uh, streaming today from Bermuda where I was born and raised, right? Uh, I, I board across here uh, uh, this week uh, to spend time with family. And that's important because Bermuda is still uh, literally a colony of England. And so uh, as a colony of England, but as a black man who uh, my biological father is from St. Louis, I live in the United States. Uh, you know, Bermuda has explicit Caribbean connections, explicit connections to Africa. It's a very unique geopolitical space to think about colonization um, but also decolonization. So I would continue to bring that lens into our conversation, but I believe it's valid that we also ground ourselves in key definitions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Allen, could you, could you add on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely appreciate the definition that uh, Dr. Tai has given us. I think one thing that we also want to consider is that the misappropriation of religion was central to colonialization across the, gro the globe, even though colonialism looked different within different parts of the world, right? So colonialism in India and in the Caribbean looks much different from colonialism in South America, as well as here in the States. And so when we think about while there were differences to those colonialist approaches, one of the central tenets to that work was that of misappropriating scripture, sacred texts, really imposing Christian dogma and theology onto the indigenous uh, individuals and or then enslaved individuals if we think about the North American context. And so with that in mind, when we're talking about decolonizing the black mind or the black Adventist mind, we are in essence saying that there needs to be a process, an intellectual, mental, emotional, psychological process through which black minds go through where they then relinquish some of the misappropriated theological understandings that has come to them by way of 
white supremacy by way of um, the political economic initiative that was colonization. Um, and so my understanding is that we're trying to encourage people to now come to a new understanding of who God is and a new understanding of who they are in relationship to God. Um, and that more than likely is a different de definition than what we traditionally received, whether your uh, religion be Adventist, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, or Catholic. So I want to build on uh, what you said, uh, and I, I want to go to Pastor uh, Souffrant because, well, two things. One, I, I, I see I see some smoke coming up, so I, I, we don't want to confuse <laughs> confuse our, our people. So I want you to uh, address that. Uh, but also, um, there was kind of this this notion of uh, with with what Claudia said that she mentioned decolonizing the black Adventist mind. And then she also said decolonizing the black mind. Could you kind of talk about that? I know you talked a little bit about that this week, but could, could you uh, bring us up to date on that? Absolutely. Well, first, uh, dealing with the smoke that's in the air. Uh, anytime I engage in spiritual practices or discussions, I light an incense of frankincense and myrrh. Uh, because those are the gifts given to the one that we call Jesus. And so um, it's an honor to be here on this panel to talk about decolonizing the uh, the Black Evidence mind. And of course, in order to decolonize the Black Evidence mind, we first need to recognize that we are Black. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> without that acceptance, without that understanding, um, there, there we really can't move forward. Um, and I think um, as we even discuss it further, part of the issue in... Um, in accepting our blackness is of course first defining what it means to be black, what it means to be black uh, for us, uh, what it means to be black in society, um, and what it means to be black to be Christian, what it means to be black as an Adventist. And so these are questions that are generally, the answers to these things are generally assumed. And I believe the first step to decolonization would be an acceptance of our identity as black. We cannot say that we're going to decolonize the black mind or the black Adventist mind without first understanding what it means to be black. And I would even take it a step further in saying it's important that we define black for ourselves. Wow. Uh, because society has done a good job in making black one thing, but we as uh, African people in origin have done a better job in creating blackness for ourselves. Um, and so learning how to embrace the excellence that is authentically black and claiming it as our own is a vital step. And let me just say this last thing, when dealing with identity, um, as it relates to colonization, the European has done a good job in having us focus on um, conceptual intellectual ideas versus spiritual realities. Wow. And so I would argue that as black people, we have to learn how to tap back into the essence of what is spirit and then derive our definitions from that space versus merely just using the intellectual or educational uh, uh, framework. So, Pastor Michelle, you you tapped uh, into this this notion of of us us realizing that we're black. I, I want to build off of what Pastor Souffrant said. You you talked about that from the Afro Latinx uh, perspective. Could you kind of kind of share your perspective on that? I, I, I can't hear you. She's muted. Uh huh. I had pressed on mute, but you know, go. the devil is alive. Anyway, um, so I had had this conversation last night, as you guys would remember, um, that it is very important as we are working on deconstructing what black is and also what we have been taught that black is, which is, I think, even uh, a bigger issue, uh, especially for the Latino community. I know that I could speak for us and I could say that um, a lot of us were taught that to be black, especially for a Dominican, it would mean that I was Haitian, which is what uh, Pastor Sufran is. And so the idea of blackness then is automatically canceled out because the people who were once our oppressors that were also helped in our liberation, but then became mm -hmm. our oppressors and occupied our country for over 20 years. And our Independence Day is not from Spain, but from them 
why on earth would we want to be called wow. the same thing that they are? So the issue is that people look at Dominicans and they say, you know, a Dominican will be black as night and say, I'm not black. But people don't understand the origin of where that belief system came from. Because wow. as I said earlier, Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt, excuse me, um, who was a heavily big contributor to Trujillo, one of the worst dictators that we had in the history of Dominican Republic, who single-handedly gave a command and wiped out over 20,000 Haitians over the Dejabon River, which is known as the Massacre River today. And the reason why this happened is because his goal was to lighten up the race because he did not want any type of affiliation with Blackness in us at all. Mm -hmm. A Dominican person is someone who is struggling with identity simply because they do not know that 90% of Dominicans are African ancestors, have African ancestry. But because we were taught what African was versus mm -hmm. what it actually is, we had a very difficult time accepting that we too are part of the black diaspora. Wow. wow. Powerful. Yeah. So, so one of the things, so I, I did a little, did when I, when I thought of who I was bring, bring on, on this panel, I was very strategic because I wanted represent, representation from different uh, ethnic, ethnicities within our racial backgrounds. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the, uh, one of the things I, I, I felt that we did not talk about is kind of the indigenous community and i wanted um i wanted pastor Sapo pastor uh, sapolin to kind of speak to what the the decolonizing the black evidence mind would look like from his perspective given his research and and family background uh thank you dr freeman um i have to first say that i i am not native american um I, I come from a uh, European American mother, African American uh, father, but I grew up for about the first 10 years of my life, about 20 miles from a uh, Native American reservation, Yakima Reservation in Washington State. And um, as I began to explore this whole concept of decolonizing spirituality and Christianity and those things, um, I stumbled across an author named Richard Twist, who really speaks about how. Um, Native Americans have undertaken uh, this decolonizing of their, they don't even say Christianity, they call it following of the way, uh, followers of Jesus, and uh, reclaiming their own traditions in the worship of Jesus Christ. And as, as I stumbled upon that, I became interested in, in really seeking out how they are doing it in order to learn, uh, to contribute what I can, and then to kind of, kind of, take their example and what they're already practicing and bring it back to my own people as part of the, the, the black diaspora and be able to apply some of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the things that they really emphasize is that decolonizing the following of Jesus uh, and, and beginning to follow Jesus through traditional ways, through their indigenous traditional ways, is really restoring the image of God. God did not create one people in ancient times uh, God did not just have Abraham. There was people all over the globe who, who were just as much God's children as Abraham was. And, and, but today we, we have a Christianity that feels as if there's only one stream that is the proper stream of the worship of Jesus Christ. And that stream starts uh, with the Hebrews. It then goes to, to the Greeks and, and, and stays in Europe until Europe expands and begins to conquer the world in a, a demonic and diabolical way. And then we, we are then taught that that stream of the worship of Jesus is the only proper one. And what that really does is it does two things. One, it, it damages the image of God because God is a God of diversity. God is a God of variety. Right. And secondly, it is idolatry in that um, it sets that tradition and those who originate from that tradition um, up as a, a godlike figure, which is really what white supremacy is. And it goes so deep as even, even the things like we had to explain what Pastor Souffrant, why he had a little bit of smoke coming out. You know, the fact that we have to explain that 
Because yeah. even science has showed us that burning things like sage, burning things like incense, actually kill bacteria mm -hmm. in the air. They actually have a positive effect. Not only a spiritual effect, but, but a, um, a physical and scientific effect. But those things have become so foreign to us because the one tradition that sets itself up as God shuns anything that, 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 that indigenous lands, that indigenous peoples that they conquered begin to practice. And, and so now when, when Pastor Safran reclaims an indigenous practice, which actually was also indigenous to the Hebrews, right. it's so foreign to us because we, we have desecrated and denigrated the image of God to one singular tradition. And so for, for Native Americans who are following Jesus through a traditional way, it's really about restoring that image um, that, that God originally intended in the diversity of humanity. Right. Thank, thank you so much for, for explaining that. Um, so one of the things that I've been, been really thinking about is what does decolon... It, it seems that we all agree that a a decolonization process needs to happen. But I'm wondering if it looks different based on ethnicity, right? So if I am from the Caribbean, would it look different than if I was in the United States? Um, so could, could one of you kind of maybe speak to that with your thoughts based on your own background, what a decolonization process would look like from your own uh, ethnic tradi tradition? Um, absolutely. Let me just say that, and I can say this very quickly. If you ask a Dominican who our motherland is, they're gonna say Spain, not Africa. Uh, hmm. So the first thing to do is to even recognize where we are from, because when we come to the reality that there is some truths that we have been too afraid to talk about, or even accept as truth. We don't even like talking about our actual history. I didn't know wow. my country's history until I went to the country and I went through the, the books that were written and I saw things that I was like, wait, what? Like people who I thought were white were actually black. People who I thought were light skinned were actually dark skinned. I spoke about it last night that even our dictator would put on makeup to look lighter, a man in the 60s. Wow. So it's it's this this it, it is going to look differently based mm -hmm. on ethnicity. It's absolutely going to look different because for us, our, our first step um, mm -hmm. is to even acknowledge that our roots are based in West Africa, which is where the first set of slaves came, by the way. They came to our island in the 1450s. Our island was the first one to, to receive slaves in the Caribbean. And so they killed off our indigenous people very early on. Wow. They, they killed them through diseases. They killed them through annihilation. So 90% is safe to say of my country is African in origin, but mm. they won't even say that. So well, I think the first step is to recognize that our motherland is not Spain. And there is a need to stop thinking that because our native tongue is Spanish, that that also means that our native country would then have to be Spain because that's not true. Wow. Well, well, that, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to just get her really quick on and how does that impact the church? So uh, I, I think yesterday when we were talking, you were you were saying it kind of from a a cultural perspective. But what does that mean for, let's say, our uh, 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 Dominican uh, Seventh Day Adventist? Right. What is that? How does that? Pro it, are you imp are they impacted by that? Absolutely. There's a double. First of all, if you go to our worship service, there are we are just now allowing drums because for a long time, drums were the instrument of devil worship. And I remember sitting in the seminary where a white professor said to us where he hit syncopated beats and said, this is devil worship. And to me, I was sitting there like, is he Latino? Because that's exactly how they think. Uh, 
if it's not a guitar or a violin or some kind of string instrument and the piano, which was just, um, you know, that that's been around uh, drums and bass guitars and certain instruments were always excluded from worship because they were they were looked at as these are not of God. And, and unfortunately, that is also translated to the treatment of women. As I said yesterday, as the only female pastor in my uh, in my conference, which covers Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, New Mexico, and um, one other country uh, state, and I I know for a fact that I have never been invited to any of my Hispanic brothers' churches because I am a woman in ministry. So I have a double negative. So I'm a black woman, and then I'm a woman. So it's 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 going to be very difficult, honestly, to progress the mind forward of Hispanics because it's not just colorism, it's also gender exclusivism. Absolutely. So, so Claudia, uh, I think you were about to say something. Man, no, you know, Pastor Moda is just, she's dropping all the knowledge. Uh, and so <laughs> I definitely want to, to affirm her on that. You know, the thing that's coming to my mind as well is that when you also think about the history of slavery within South America, within Brazil, they have a similar narrative as well in that their indigenous people, as well as their African uh, people were, uh, experienced great genocide. And so there is a huge um, lack of desire to acknowledge that history of what happened in avoidance of what happened in that country and thus in avoidance of their history and connection to the continent. But, um, I also want to just second her point that decolonization is definitely going to look different based on ethnicity, right? So as we've heard now from the Afro-Latin experience, they need to first acknowledge their African connection. From the Black American experience, we actually have experienced erasure in this country. So our connection to colonialism here was extensive delete of your connection to the continent. So many black Americans do not have documentation, records, yeah. Yeah. yay, knowledge of what country in Africa they are even potentially connected to. So mm -hmm. oftentimes this is why you'll get a lot of pushback from black but from some black Americans that oh well you know you're African. Well, um mm, am I? Because I cannot actually say where on the continent my ancestry is connected to, right? And then you you, you end up kind of being a, a, a body, a person, an experience that is not African enough, but not American either. Right. And so your identity as a result of colonialism is one that is hardcore erasure. Mm -hmm. How does that then show up with us spiritually and religiously, right? Wow. Yeah. That then means that whenever you try to present something to me that is inherently African, and I have potentially been taught from Europeans that various African practices are attached to spiritualism, say that, attached to devil worship, because I have no direct connection to that culture. I have no direct access. That, that, and that's the other thing. It's not even so much acknowledgement for us. It's do I even have access to this knowledge, uh, this truth? So I'm taking the white man's word about me. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, exactly. am, I, am, I am forcefully in a position to where I am now taking the white man's word about me and about my history and about my people. So that black Americans have to go through a process of writing their own history. And that in spite of not having access to certain things, in spite of not being directly connected, I have to do the intentional work of reconnecting myself to the continent, reconnecting myself to my ancestry. And that is a very difficult work to do because here in the States, there is a very long history of, of tension between Black Americans and Black immigrants. Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Let's, let's go there. Let's, let's just hit it where it's at. And so I, if, 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 
before we can really, as before black Americans, can, some black Americans, particularly black conservative Adventists, before black conservative Adventists can become comfortable embracing more indigenous, natural, spiritual practices from the continent or the Caribbean, there has to be an addressing of just the flat out tension and conflict that black Americans have with black immigrants and the culture and the ideology and the identity that comes along with that because our whole being is, is firmly rooted and attached to this country. I'll say this and then I'll, I'll let Jeremiah go. For black Americans, our religion, our religious practice is rooted here. And we did come up with a, a, a religious engagement that I do believe is authentic to our experience and authentic to this soil. And so I think that decolonizing um, a black mind from the religious standpoint is a much different conversation for us because from the beginning in slavery, we had hush harbors. We had engagement and uh, an approach to religion that was saying, hey, I'm trying to divert. I'm trying to make in intentional departures from the white man's um, approach to Christianity and that which he has given me as Christianity. And so just like Pastor Moda said, what we do and how we do it to decolonize and to, and to separate and to reaffiliate our blackness to the continent and and to begin to really seek and understand God in a truly germane and authentic uh, blackness, Africanness is something that's going to be much different for us. Right. Absolutely. And, and uh, I mean, you, you said uh, a lot of what <laughs> a lot a lot a lot of points I was going to make about halfway through. You went ahead and made those points, and what you're saying is right on. Um, something I think that we need to um, discuss as African Americans is um, uh, Michelle and Lawrence. Their, their their people's origin stories have already been discussed in in in, in this this forum just in a few minutes. As African Americans, we're taught through the movies. Whenever it's a movie, it's a slave movie. You know, right. like we're we're taught through the movies that we don't have origin stories. We're taught we don't have language. Uh, we're taught we don't have these these basic. Um, components and aspects that, that make up identity. But in reality, we do. Uh, when we heard about the Dominican um, origin story, it started in Africa. She started it in Africa, but then she included being Dominican. When we heard about the Haitian origin story. She, it started in Africa, but then it included being, being Haitian. And I really think we need to come to, we, we need to start our story not when we were slaves. Correct. Yeah. Start our story when we were Africans who mm -hmm. then went through slavery and out of slavery, we formed a new people group Absolutely. who are both, we are African Americans, but we are also Africans. Yes. We yes. have our own language. Ebonics is just as legitimate as Haitian Creole, yes. as yeah. Creole yeah. Sierra like Leone. Yes. It's, ju it's just mm -hmm. as legitimate Absolutely. as, as, as uh, Patois in Jamaica. Yes. Yes. Ebonics is just as legitimate. We need to start realizing that these, these, these these things that make up your identity are are not we're not only take try they try to take them away from us and right. this mm -hmm. and, and it's still trying to take them away from us mm -hmm. but we have we we still have them they still exist yeah. um my my wife is part of the timney tribe in sierra leone west africa she was born in west africa she was raised in in the united states uh, something i was amazed at when i began dating her and began to come around her family is being African-American, I had so much in common with West Africans. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, like my mother is white, but when I get in West African groups, whether it be people from Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, I feel more at home. I'm mm -hmm. able to maneuver easier than I do in white circles, even though I have a white mother. And yeah. it's because culture, being culturally African-American, we still have so much that is yep. still there, despite slavery, despite Jim Crow, despite mm -hmm. uh, uh, systemic oppression and, and all of this. We still have so much that is still there, but we're told every day that we don't. Mm -hmm. But we have all of that. And I think we need to, in order to come to a point of decolonizing our, our spirituality, we have to, like, like 
uh, Pastor Lawrence said, we have to realize, look, you're, we're black, but we're not only black and we're not only African-American, we're African. African. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And Doc, real quick before we uh, move forward, I just want to also make this distinction because you guys are really going in right now, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when dealing with history, we also need to be reminded that we not only assimilated with the dominant culture, but we also assimilated with the indigenous people. And so some of us who came from Africa fled slavery and grouped with Native Americans. Some of the West Africans who came to Haiti fled slavery and grouped with the indigenous people of the island at the time. And, um, and the same thing happened in, in, in South America. And so this idea um, that, and the reason, well, before I say what I was about to say, the reason why we were able to assimilate with the native uh, or the indigenous people was because their ideologies and practices were very similar to our ideology and practices before colonialism. And so with Haitians, for example, one of our running jokes <laughs> is that Dominicans are just light-skinned Haitians. Oh, uh, <laughs> we, we, we say that because um, as far as all the Haitians I know, we've never looked at Dominicans as separate people. And, and, while, and while Pastor Moda gave the history of how, um, and which I didn't know that it was common for them to uh, view their motherland as Spain, I never, I never knew that. But it does bring context as to why there was so much tension, because Haitians always saw Dominican, Dominicans as one people with just, they were lighter skinned and therefore had a certain level of favor in the dominant culture, et cetera, et cetera. It never even crossed my mind that Dominicans actually viewed themselves as separate people from Haitians. And so I think if we're going to decolonize our, our minds, we have to go back to that point of origin where we are, in fact, one people having multiple experiences based on our location and, and just what happened to our ancestors. It makes sense. I mean, without going too much into, well, I'll go a little bit into how Haitians even view their revolutionary process. The way that we view Dominicans were those who sided with Spain. That was our ideology. They were our people who sided with Spain. That's how we understood it. But now sitting here hearing the other side of it, it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I had no idea uh, that you guys saw us as the oppressors when we saw ourselves fighting the oppressors, which was Spain. Spain was the and the French, I might also add, they were the ones trying to make us slaves. We were the ones trying to make us free again because we were already free before we got there. And so we th there needs to be kind of a, a re-education, I would argue, that us fighting for decolonization is not just about taking in practices. It's about recognizing that these practices have deep connections to our being. Right. And so I'm not just lighting incense because Africans did it. When I light an incense, I'm reminded of not just what my ancestors did, but I'm, I am going to a place where they were able to experience God in a very authentic way. I'm not just doing it because it's the African thing to do. And when I had my own experience with God, through lighting incense, I continued to light incense. And being free is having the ability to explore these avenues without condemnations uh, from those who just view the white supremacist viewpoint as the only way of doing things. So I just want to um, just add just really quickly um, to what Pastor Lawrence has said, Pastor Front has said. Um, I think that even the joke, even what you said though, right? Like even the joke um, and even the term shows that that Haitians are sitting within that seat point of view position of power. And so they are then imposing or projecting on to Dominicans uh, from that standpoint, right? So it's like you're seeing that Dominicans are, are a part of Haitians and, and they just turn their back. No, like that's because though that you had at one point ownership of them. And so your point of Actually, view, no. it, it, it wasn't ownership of them. We they, they we we never that the Haitians never owned slaves. So it wasn't ownership of them. It was it was a difference in perspective. When when you look at Haitian history, when Haitians were revolting, there were some Haitians who to join the Spanish and the French for their various reasons. There were right. some who decided to continue to rebel, and then there were some who just fled and defended their own personal territory. When you're dealing with with the Dominican Republic, the uh, the 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 mulatto Haitians 
were receiving favor from Spain and France, even to this day, where after our revolution, they traded with the mulatto Haitians, but not with the darker black Haitians. And so we have always been fighting for equality, even since our revolution, while no, the mulatto not. ones were the ones who were free to engage in global trade and all of that. So maybe I misunderstood what, you're, what you meant by power, because we've never yeah, no, had power I don't, yeah, no, I'm not saying that. I definitely understand kind of like the Haitian history of revolt and whatnot, but I'm speaking more so to the historical context that Pastor Moda has just shared with us in terms of the country's engagement with the Dominican and their power system and structure with the Dominican Republic, basically the other side of Hispaniola, the island. So not so much, um, you know, your initial independence history, but okay. more probably your more contemporary engagement with the Dominican Republic and how problematic that has been for them. Thus, their desire to not want to be affiliated and connected with you culturally and nationally. Yeah, I see the problem we have with the Dominican Republic very similar to the problem that we have with white Americans in that the ones with the favor don't like us trying to gain equality. And so the, Dominic, the, the Dominican Republic had better access than we did. We gained our independence first, as Pastor Moda uh, had pointed out, but we couldn't even occupy the entire island because of these mulattoes who were once our people. See, when I say we were once people, once one people, we weren't one people under the name Haiti. You know, that, that that's not what I'm saying. Um, but when we became Haitians, we tried to occupy the entire island. We were met with the resistance by those who now call themselves Dominican. That, that was a, a, a name that was put on this people much later. You see what I mean? And so we were, it was like a civil war is what it actually was. But in ideology, or at least in, uh, in ideology and also in storytelling, the Haitians saw it as more of a civil war narrative while I'm learning today that Dominicans actually saw it as these people are oppressing us. You see, uh, that I mean, in other words, yeah. we were not in agreement with who the enemy was. We, Haitians, who we call Haitians, were in agreement that Spain and France, they're the enemies. The Dominicans apparently were in agreement that we were the enemies. <laughs> and so without, and I, I see that even in America today. All black people don't see white supremacy as the enemy. In fact, there are plenty of black people who see the white way of doing things as a better way, a more sophisticated and honorable way. Mm -hmm. And so they're fighting black people who are looking to be indigenous as if we're trying to set ourselves backwards. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to a uh, plenty of these black folks who I still consider my people, but may be a little confused in my, in my perspective. Yeah, so- I wanna I, give I wanna... Michelle the, the chance to, to respond and give some context to this, but I guess mm -hmm. I would, I would still push back just a little bit um, mm -hmm. because there is a part of me, and I guess my point that I'll just say briefly is I think that we all, um, as persons of color, white persons, what have you, uh, need to be willing to recognize our blind spots and yeah. see that there are spaces and positions um, for even an oppressed people to be an oppressor. Yeah, uh, yeah. In conversation with, um, uh, one of That's my really it. good friends, Pastor Manny Artiega, he's a Mexican American. He said this so profoundly. He said, you know, in talking about the Mexican American experience, that one of the things that they struggle with the most whenever it comes to dealing with or speaking out about any kind of oppression, whether it's here in the States or in Mexico, is that they are fundamentally dealing with the fact that they are both oppressor and oppressed pe person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so I think that like even we as black people have to get to a place where we can become comfortable acknowledging that there are times when, yes, you are the oppressed body and there are times when you are oppressing. I, as a black woman, have experienced a lot of oppression from black men. Right. That, that. that even if I personally don't have narratives. Right. There is a historical narrative that suggests that black men, when they could not inflict the kind of power over white men, began to treat black women the way white men were treating them. Mm -hmm. So all, so all I'm saying is, is that whether it be a narrative between um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, whether it be white people and blacks here in America, uh, whatever it is, 
we all as humans, I fundamentally believe, have oppressive blind spots. And we must be willing to say that we write our narratives with us as the hero every single time. And mm -hmm. there is more than likely a chance that there is another people group, a, another body that feels like, you know what? You weren't the oppressed person in this situation. I was. Well, I, I, I want to uh, jump in here to make sure that uh, Dr. Uh, Douglas gets a chance to uh, to get in here, particularly as it relates to uh, the complexity of his own origin, being both American uh, or African-American and uh, Bermudian. And uh, and and now I'm understanding as I as I as I'm learning about Bermuda at, at, at points, they see themselves as a part of the Caribbean and and other points they don't. Could you could you just talk about uh, we're seeing that this is a messy conversation, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, this is yeah. a messy conversation and it needs to happen. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And then you add on spirituality to it. Yeah, uh, it, it's not like it's not like because we became Adventists, all the shackles of colonialism have been taken off. So could you talk about it from sure. that perspective? Yeah, that's good. I think the, the conversation that's been happening is great as well. I was just sitting back and, and just enjoying it as you know, as an audience member for a sec. But um, you know, I think I want to get back to your question as well in the context of uh, of it looking different in different spaces, right? Um, that's the fruit, but but the root of the process I think needs to look or will look similarly. And I want to share a couple of resources. Um, so the work, writing of uh, Foucault. Uh, and uh, Spivak, uh, these are post, what we call post-colonial scholars. They've written post-colonial theory. And one of the, 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 uh, the concepts or tenets of that is epistemic violence, right? Thinking about our ways of knowing, right? Like, like you know, how we've come to know who we are or what we think has been infringed upon. And so when you talk about the process, I believe that the process may look similar. Or, or the, the, the process of unlearning or reflecting on the epistemic violence that we've experienced may look similar, but the, but the engagement and what it looks like in the, in the fruit stage may look different. So if, you, if, you're, if you're considering epistemic violence, you begin to ask different questions. You begin to ask questions like, uh, where did this come from? Um, you know, where did it begin? Um, you know, so when I think about uh, a, a space like Bermuda, um, you know, who, who were the first missionaries that came over and which brand of Adventism did they bring? Mm. Um, mm. You know, you know, what were the tracks that were given? And we, and we often make this assumption in, in Adventism that like there's this sort of every awareness as relates to doctrines and what people believe. Right. I was I was astounded as I've sat in seminary over the last two and a half years where there's a metaphor out there in that space where it's like it's a ballpark metaphor. Like some people in left field, some people in right field, some people in uh, people are in the stands and that's actually accepted. Like there are differences within our denomination. Yet what was shared with you as the dominant ideology is often different depending on the space that you're in, which is why I started with reflecting on epistemic violence, because white supremacy I believe it inhibits our creativity to even imagine beyond what we've been given. Right. And so I believe it's critical that we begin to think about where did it start and consider then the contextual realities of the specific geopolitical spaces that we're in. Um, Brian Stevenson said something quite interesting recently. I heard him share, and he was talking about how while the uh, North... Is Brian is, Stevenson is, is the, uh, 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 yeah, a lawyer. Um, he's over the Equal Justice Institute. Um, I've written a book, Just Mercy, and a movie, That's Just Mercy. Mercy. Thank you for, uh, for, for, for allowing me to, sh to share that additional context about him. Uh, he was actually interviewed by Dr. Bird recently, and he shared something powerful that I think is contextual here. He mentions that, he mentioned that while you know, the North won the war, that the South won the narrative war. Mm. I, I, I won't let that yeah. sink in, right? Like, so, yeah, while the it's North true. won the, the, the war of, you know, uh, of, of physical supposed liberation, if you will, the narrative war of the South is what has, what, is what has prevailed. And I would like to suggest that the South in, this, in, in the United States is any result of Canada. Like, we like to try <laughs> to make these demarcations. Like, this yeah. is a, the, the United States is a plantation, it was a colony as well. And so I, I think that we need to <laughs> rethink about even when we talk about colonization, it's not just about Bermuda or uh, an island, mm. though I think Bermuda for me and my identity as a black man who was conceived in Huntsville, Alabama, <laughs> born in Bermuda, and now back in my father's state in, in Missouri, 
uh, I feel like I have a unique sort of purview because when you begin to see oppression in multiple spaces, you begin to ask different questions, right? Mm -hmm. And like, it's like, man, okay, uh, like I saw that there, but it's just a little bit of a tweak, but it's sort of the same thing, but just a little different, right? And many of us, we've only been in one space. So the beauty of even this moment and these conversations is that we're beginning to triangulate the diversity of what oppression looks like, though it has the same root. That same root is white supremacy, which suggests that if you are not white, if you are not of a Eurocentric origin, and whatever that looks like, whether it be worship styles, as we've mentioned here, theologies, uh, uh, very value systems, then we have been told that we are inferior. That's the colonial right. mindset, and we've embraced that. And so to challenge that across the various ethnic spaces and, and geopolitical spaces, we have to ask different questions. Where did it begin? Who brought this here? Who told us this was the way it had to be? And we need to ask those spaces also in black and, ex and as well African-American spaces because we've also replicated things that were given to us. Rather, even at our beloved institutions like the Oakwoods, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and and the P Pine Forge Academies. Who who said that it has to be? Oh, like who said mm -hmm. it's gonna be that? Type? Like like we're, we're, why do we celebrate the Aeolians, but like DP is sort of on the side? Like why why yeah. why, why do we do that? Let's let's be clear because again we continue to reinforce <laughs> and reify that which we were given so it was given to us in a, in a in a package that said this is what it must look like and again we have never at times taken the time to reflect on the epistemic violence that inhibits our capacity to reimagine that's what this moment is about and that's why the root is asking different questions truth telling shifts of narratives and really looking at the origins of where stuff began. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm out of time, Dr. Freeman, but I, at some point I want to also share what that looks like in Bermuda um, as relates to how the Adventist church began here and, and, and what that looks like as relates to now what we have. Uh, keep, and keep rolling while you're, while you're rolling. Just keep rolling. Just so, keep so, rolling. So, so just real quick, right? Um, I, I think one of the beauties of, of our space, and in, in Bermuda in particular, is um, that uh, the Adventist church, uh, it, it's like the, I believe, like the, as raised to uh, 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 representations, like the fourth largest, fifth largest denomination here. Um, and we have a strong history, right, of, uh, uh, of uplift. Um, when, you, when you embrace Adventism, you don't just embrace, you know, the religious piece, but there are cultural elements as relates to education, right? So many people, they didn't just get the religious piece, but they moved up like two or three social classes across generations as a result of the entire package. Right. The wow. rule following and the yeah, other yeah, pieces yeah. of colonialism. Somebody said to me recently, my dear colleague, I want to mention Dwayne Keynes, Dwayne A. Keynes, uh, brilliant <laughs> scholar. And there are many brilliant Bermudians. So I just want to just acknowledge because this space is one where we, we've we've had those opportunities. And yet we also, I think, have challenged at times the inferiority narrative with our one to one dollar with the U.S. Mm. Right. Like that economic piece, that that suggestion that, hey, listen, I've seen black accents, but I'm not inferior to anybody, including my African-American brothers and sisters. So that's why Bermudians will come at you straight, Dr. Freeman, and say, <laughs> no, don't, don't throw us all in that same pot. There are diverse ways that we have experienced our blackness. And that's not to say that we haven't been, ha haven't been colonized. But again... It has impacted how we embrace or move into different spaces. So I'm from, a, I'm, we're in a colony, and yet when you think about even the origin of like a DP, it was started by a Bermudian. Right. Right? Uh, uh, Stephen Manders, right? So it's this interesting space where you have oppression uh, and you've had sort of white supremacy, but you've also had the notion that, hey, listen, you're not, you're not better than me. And that's an interesting tension that I believe that we have in this space that has also played out contemporarily as it relates to the fruit and what also decolonization looks like for black Adventists here. Uh, uh, Pastor Sapolin uh, was trying to get in earlier. Uh, did you did you still want to want to say something? Uh, we can't hear you. I, I do have something to say, but I would refer to Pastor Mona if she want, because earlier she was going to contribute and we she didn't get a chance to get in if she'd like to. Oh, no, I go ahead and go first, because I've said a lot. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Douglas, I think hits um, a major point on wh where where it began. Um, if you really look at the whole thing, we have to look at a theology of dominance that starts really with in the Hellenistic period with with uh, Alexander the Great. It goes through. Uh, by the time you get to Constantine, Christianity has adopted the theology of dominance. Uh, prior to Constantine, there's a book called Early Christianity, which um, uh, Dr. Freeman, I'll send to you later so you can you can put in the resources. But it talks about how there was there was 
upwards of several hundred forms of Christianity by the time Constantine comes around. And they were all based on culture. You see the beginnings of that when Jesus is relating to Jews. He says, um, I am the fulfillment of your history. He, he relates to the, the Samaritan woman. I'm uh, the Samaritan woman. I'm a fulfillment of your history. Um, we get to Paul. He gets to Athens. He's like, look, let me tell you about the unknown God. Jesus is the fulfillment of your history. And, and you find that. But then Constantine uh, institutes in Christianity the, this, uh, this theology of dominance. And we like to kind of talk about Constantine and Adventism about the Sabbath. But we don't talk about what I believe is the true Babylon, which is white supremacy uh, rooted in the theology of dominance that, that was instituted by Constantine. And at that point, you then have the Christianity adopts this, this, this theology of dominance. And then you have Europe begins to spread across the world. And in every land they get to, what they met with almost exclusively is people who have a peaceful and accepting uh, spirituality and culture. Uh, there's an author called Rutgers Bergman, Rutgers Bergman, who has a book called Humankind, Humankind, as in humans are kind. Um, and he talks about how we have been, um, and he doesn't say through white supremacy, but I, and through Christianity, through, through European um, traditional Christianity, but I, I've made that connection, that we have been taught that humans are um, inherently bad, that humans are inherently bad, where the Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God. And so according to the Bible, humans are inherently in the image of God. So humans are inherently good. But when Europeans with this theology of dominance get, get to these lands, they're able to dominate these people, commit genocide, uh, enslave people, because they're met with people who are open to accepting the stranger. That's why now you have Western nations that don't want the strangers, because mm. they realize that when they were strangers, they acted in a certain way. And there's this, this in inherent thought that the stranger is going to do to us what we do to the stranger. And so now you have adopted in Christianity this theology of dominance. And so you, now you have Seventh-day Adventists who believe that if you're not Seventh-day Adventist, then you are part of Babylon, that you're, you're not uh -oh. going to heaven. Now you have, you, you have in Christianity this thought that if you do not um, believe everything that is the, 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 uh, the main doctrines and dogma of Christianity, then, then you cannot go to heaven. That if you're right. Muslim, you can't go to heaven. If you're Buddhist, you can't go to heaven. If you follow traditional indigenous ways, whether it's from Africa or India or, or whatever, Central America, then, then you can't go to heaven. It's this theology of dominance. And so when we uh, have been inundated and taught this, this theology of dominance, it becomes part of our thinking. And so you have situations, the tribalism that we, that we visited earlier between, between Haiti and, and uh, the Dominican Republic, you have when Africans come to, uh, to America, think of African Americans are lazy, but then uh, uh, African Americans are, my, my brother-in-law, he always tells me that when he first came to the States, all the African American kids called him an African booty scratcher. You know, mm -hmm. he's like, that's, they call me that name every day at school. And you, you have this tribalism where we then try to dominate each other because we have been taught through white supremacy, this, this theology of dominance. When, when we when we hold revivals, what do we call them? Not just revivals, we call them crusades. Right. You know, we call them crusades. Yeah. Like our entire theology is built on dominance, but that is Oof. not only opposite yeah. to the character yeah. of God; it is opposite to who we were before we were we before we were victims of genocide and victims of slavery. That's not That's who deep. we are. Which deep. which begs the question, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll end with this: is what greater reflects the character of God? These traditional cultures and spiritualities that were kind, accepting, almost like there's exceptions. You know, I, the generalization assumes the exception. But when the Europeans landed on these 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 lands, they were able to to dominate these people and take these people over because these people reflected the character of Christ, even if they had not yet picked up the New Testament, they reflected the character of the creator. And so when you come <laughs> with the character of the devil, you're able to start killing these people because they were accepting. And, and, and so I think that we need to realize that the reason why we view each other a certain way and we feel the need to a, a tribalism where we want to dominate 
uh, where we have these implicit biases or, or, or uh, oppressive attitudes, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Allen, Dr. Claudia Allen said. Um, and the reason why we have this, this hesitancy to accept indigenous things, whether we originate in Africa or in different parts of the world, uh, if you're part of Christianity, and especially sometimes Adventism, is because we have been taught this theology of dominance, and it is contrary to the character of Christ. And if we are to get into the character of Christ, we will find often enriched by the, these traditional things more than what has been handed to us through European traditions. Wow. I, I had never heard of a theology of, of dominance. Thank you so much for, for sharing, sharing that. Um, so we're getting close to the halfway mark. Uh, and we, uh, and in the second half, what we'll do is, um, the last, the first, on the first panel, um, Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst introduced this concept of sovereignty. So we're going to kind of unpack that, uh, in the second half, but I want to give a doc, uh, well, pastor, uh, Michelle an opportunity if she w still wanted to, uh, maybe mention a few things, uh, to give her the oppor opportunity to do so. So I just, I just wanted to clarify some things that I heard said, um, you know, and I'm not trying to sound like I am attacking. I just want to educate because I think sometimes we get into our feelings when we talk about these kind of topics. They're sensitive, of course, but I just want to make sure that we shy away from that and we just watch history as it actually unfolded. And it's important to note um, that, in fact, the French slaves did occupy the Dominican Republic for over 20 years. And when the Dominican Republic became uh, independent, um, it wasn't just from slate, from Spain. It was also from Haiti because they were trying to impose French language instruction on the entire island. But we're Hispanic. So we speak Spanish. So to impose your culture on someone else's culture is exactly what was done to them and is exactly what they were doing to us. So our pushback was a pushback, not just to a people, but it was a pushback to language. It was a pushback, as Jeremiah so rightfully said, to religious practices that were trying to be pushed on us. Um, Dominicans don't practice voodoo, which is one of the major religions over in Haiti, but they do practice Santeria. However, our biggest religion is actually Catholicism. It's the biggest religion that is practiced on the island. And right now, as the population goes, in terms of the, the uh, Adventist church and the entire population of Dominican Republic, I'm actually happy to say that one out of 34 people in the Dominican Republic are Seventh-day Adventist, or they consider themselves some type of member of the Adventist church. So not, um, not all is lost in terms of religion, however, as well, it's you have to know that when these white settlers came as missionaries to bring their religion, because that's what it is, and that is completely. Um, I really appreciate you, Pastor Sapola, and what you said. It, it it was their interpretation of Adventism that came to our island, and even to this day, wearing skirts that are long, wearing long stockings. Women are not necessarily pastors because they're not. Uh, they were not seen as someone that can contribute to Adventism. And so most of those uh, countries, and, and even in Bermuda, Michelle, I believe, Hill is, is the female pastor there, is. I want to be specific. She is the female pastor of an entire country. Wow. And I need to, to be clear um, that it's her, and I think there's only one other one that's that's recent. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Douglas. But I I spoken to Michelle, and we've spoken about this. And you know, in my context here in America, in the states, I'm still the only one as well. I want to just be clear. I want to be clear that history is what it is. We cannot change what it is. It came, it happened. And so from here, we move forward. It's not based on biases or opinions or what I think happened, but I just wanted to be clear and clarify the record for the record that there was a lot that happened between Haiti and Dominican Republic. The tensions have been a little bit alleviated as of late. They've been helping a lot each other out. They've both been 
been devastated by hurricanes and climate things that have happened, which has forced them to work together. And we thank God for that. And and I, I do, because in all honesty, I think that it's not so much of you adopting someone else's culture. It's about you being able to thrive in your own. But it's also a recognition of where that culture came from and why I behave and and treat people as Pastor Sapolin rightly said, it's not about me being the dominant culture or me being the better culture or any of that. It's literally how can we move forward? These conversations mostly tend to pull us back to the past, but it doesn't really leave much resolution for the future. And I'm hoping that through your through your decolonizing the Black Adventist mind, as I said, once we can recognize that we are all colored, we are all Black people who have experienced tribulations at the hands of other Blacks or at the hands of other oppressors, that we can move forward from here. I don't want the conversation to get stuck and we don't get a resolution to the problems that we already know exist. And Dr. Wow. Freeman, if I could just jump in real quick as you, before you transition, um, just to tie those two comments together. I think Dr. Sapolin also hit on something that's critical. Um, and I love what you just shared, Pastor Michelle. The, the reality is that these, these untruths are continuing to be taught um, now, right? So I'm, you know, in my last semester of a class, uh, in seminary, and this is the book that we're reading called The Story of Christianity. And you see <laughs> where, it, where the same Christianity starts, right? And so for me, I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Trace White. He's a Bermudian who wrote a book many years ago. It was called Scandal of the Universe. But in this book, he was the first person who's, who I read, uh, whom I read who, who suggested that Christianity didn't just begin in the New Testament, but like, he pushed me to think about the reality of Christianity being a, a, an experience that began in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a narrative shifting truth that's important as well, right? That, um, you know, religion doesn't earn being a follower of Christ. And I think we need to begin to rethink again, that's, that's a, a, an origin question or, or, or an origin reconsideration of the beginnings of things and how we've embraced um, wholesale you know, uh, a religion that has said, this is what it has to look like. I will share this as we transition. I want to be very practical today. You know, as a person who was born around the church, my dad who raised me, who loved me from, um, very, you know, as from almost from birth and, and, and adopted me as his own was not Adventist. Uh, and so I've always chosen to be around Adventist. My mom's family was, but my dad wasn't. And yet I was raised in a, around an Adventist context that suggested effectively that because he wasn't Adventist, he couldn't be saved, right? right? I mean, I mean, you think about just the, the, the psychological realities of that. I'm actually at his house now. You can see the African prints and stuff behind me. <laughs> so I was raised in this sort of context where it was okay to embrace my Africanness, but I also chose to be around like the church folk. And so it was never forced upon me to be them. Like I, I chose to be around them, but I, I also had the freedom to embrace and consider other realities. And that hasn't been the experience of many who were raised in quote unquote traditional Adventist homes. In fact, I see a lot of resentment and frustration from people with, from the, with legitimate discontent who have felt like they've spent 20, 30, 40 years doing stuff that they were told this is what it has to look like and they thought it was like a thus saith the Lord edict when it was actually somebody's cultural preference. And so today, like this afternoon, I plan to take my youngest son, he's here with me, we're gonna go swimming on Sabbath for the very first time. Like, I didn't do that. So in Bermuda, you grew up and you drove across the water and it looked the best on Sabbath. But right. you couldn't suppose to go swimming. So you can go for a nature walk, but not a nature swim. Like, who told us that? But then I moved to the States, to my border crossing, and I go and church is finished by 12 in the state conference space that I'm in, and they're hunting by one. Right. Right? So who told us how we engage and experience Sabbath and rest and the joy of even going vertical to have uh, ask God directly, what is it that you would have me to do? And I believe as we transition this conversation around decolonizing the black Adventist mind, it's being open to ask those questions and to ask them even for ourselves. Because frankly, unfortunately, um, the control and the colonization process also is perpetuated through seminaries where you have pastors who come out and are not even comfortable with the ambiguity and the things that they don't even fully know. That's the reality. And so we perpetuate what the system says rather than actually giving people freedom to actually study for themselves and to talk about some of these truths and the ballpark, the reality that everybody doesn't believe the same thing, even as we're part of the same uh, denominational context. Well, thank you, Dr. Ty, for, 
for kind of summarizing that uh, for us. I I think this is this is good, and based on what I'm seeing here uh, from the comment section, that are they're really engaged in. Um, and uh, I think this is is going to even get better as we uh, go into the second half of this. Um, uh, if you've enjoyed this uh, discussion, you won't want to miss towards a Black Adventist theology, which will take place on Sabbath, October seventeenth uh, at two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The panelists will will include Dr. Olive Hemmings, Pastor Terrence Taylor and Pastor uh, uh, Ingram, Ingram London and Pastor Danielle Pilgrim. Additionally, we will provide, uh, we provided our panelists, today's panelists, with a list of resources that addresses the issue of decolonizing the mind. To get access to that list and, and links to the associated resources, please go to my professional Facebook page at uh, facebook.com backslash Sydney Freeman Jr. I would also ask everyone to go to my YouTube channel, Sydney Freeman Jr. and subscribe. We have 214 subscribers and I need 500 subscribers uh, to provide even more rich content. So uh, while we're talking right now, go to uh, my YouTube page, uh, my YouTube channel, uh, Sydney Freeman Jr. and subscribe. Uh, we initially had one video uh, three weeks ago, which was this uh, the first decolonizing the Black Adventist Mind panel, and it actually uh, only had that video on there. Uh, from from that time, uh, we have 22 fresh and original video content, and uh, so please. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. You'll have access to all those uh, videos. They'll, they even have uh, interviews with me uh, following up after the recent uh, the recent uh, first panel. And then uh, each of our each of our panelists today, we uh, this week we had one on one interviews with them, and so you'll get to hear more from them that way. So to facilitate a program of this quality, it costs. Uh, my wife and I have made a commitment and covenant with God uh, that we would uh, support uh, facilitating such conversations uh, through this medium. Uh, the panel and other initiatives affiliated with this ministry are not not funded by a church or a uh, or a uh, a conference. Uh, so we need your support. Uh, no gift is too small or too large. If you uh, feel so moved, please donate to uh, the Venmo that we that you'll see uh, see uh, on the screen uh, soon. Also, I'll, I'll have options for PayPal and uh, Cash App links on the screen. Now, let's take a quick break and we will come back and talk about this notion of sovereignty.
we're back. Uh, before we we get moving, I want uh, those of you that have questions, please begin putting those questions uh, in the chat or the comment section, whether on Facebook or YouTube. We have someone that's going to be looking out for questions, so we want to make sure that we get to answer everyone's questions. Uh, we're also going to have um, the social media contact of of each of our participants is going to be in there where their name is so that you'll have access to them, maybe their website. Uh, so if, if you want to find out more about uh, about them and what they're doing, you can access that uh, information. Uh, so now we'll transition back to our panelists. Awesome. I think we've we've been having a really engaged conversation and I'm looking forward to this next this next section of our discussion. And so I, I actually want to go back and um, and start with uh, with Dr. Douglas on on this. Uh, in the first panel, we talked about this whole notion of sovereignty within the Seventh Day Adventist Church and what that may look like. And so uh, online there were there were different definitions that were uh are different takeaways from what that meant uh could you talk about from your perspective what sovereignty is and is it something that we should be aspiring to yeah so uh, appreciate that question um i want to highlight again your definition that you shared at the beginning of this conversation as it relates to sovereignty um and that is being led or owned by black people now um, in the previous conversation, panel uh, part one, um, there was an explicit uh, declaration of the need to imagine and perhaps pursue uh, even a specific black uh, denomination, you know, Adventist denomination. I know that was part of the conversation. Um, you know, I, I've, and, and Dr. Claudia, it was good to hear your thoughts earlier this week as well on that. I've been wrestling with um, sovereignty and what that looks like. And I'll be honest, I am, um, I'm a both and guy. Like, I, I, you know, I believe that we needed, you know, Malcolm and Martin. I believe that there are multiple ways to uh, engage and to diversify our activism. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I, I appreciate the conversation. I think it's a necessary one. Um, what it looks like, I believe, is something that we need to really critically reflect on because a lot of times when we, again, have been a part of one structure, um, all we know is really to replicate what we have and it'll just be maybe in black face, right? And so I think that's one of my questions around to create our own. Like, I don't, I don't have the energy to create or, or to lead <laughs> the efforts to create our own denomination that's Adventist. For me, sovereignty looks like actually rethinking not just the macro level of what it means to be Seventh-day Adventist, but especially even this corona context. Like, all of us are having to reimagine what does it look like to be a minister, right? To engage in ministry. And it's so wonderful that these big monstrosities of buildings have had to close, and now we've begun to look at each of ourselves, ourselves as, as ministers, as, as, as the hands and feet of Jesus. So um, I would love to think about it on a macro level that uh, it may need to look like having your own business, having your own nonprofit, um, being able to engage in the ministry work that maybe walks us alongside the denomination. And there may be some who, who are listening who feel called to actually lead a movement that is, you know, Adventist, but, you know, black owned. Um, for me, there's a part of me that also feels like we help to build this church. Like, I, I also want my reparations. <laughs> If we're going to take our own, like I need all, I mean, the tithe that we sent up as well. Like, what what happens if that? So again, like, I don't, I, I also challenge the notion that the church belongs to white folks. Like, like, you know what I mean? And so to sort of also want to create my own, I, I wonder if it's, if is that giving in to white supremacy? I, I you know, and and do we want to also say, listen, this is our church? Uh, and so I appreciate folks who have begun to reimagine that. I think of my colleague Mike Polite and others who have you know, begun to reimagine what the Adventist message looks like and creating a nonprofit and movements, and many of us are doing it. Some of us have started churches. I have friends and colleagues who are doing work in South Africa and, you know, do, I mean, have, you know, so I think sovereignty may need to look differently on the micro, the mezzo, and the macro level and being creative enough to imagine what it looks like to be sovereign for ourselves and what God has called each of us to do, I believe is a vital part of that conversation. But for me and my house, 
Um, you know, we started a, a helped to plant a church in a city that only had one Adventist church before we got there. It was historically uh, a historically white church and uh, beautiful people. Um, yet I also recognized that there was a there was missing uh, generations of beautiful black Seventh Day Adventists in my city because there had never been. Uh, a place that was grounded and created for them. And so sovereignty for me looked like helping to raise that up. And while we've walked alongside the denomination, we're not limited to the denomination. And so I think when we think about sovereignty, we can no longer outsource um, our creativity or our finances to the denominational structure alone to decide what happens with our money, our time, and our talents. All right. I, I, I also want to... Uh, one of the things that I, I did in a uh, conversation with Pastor Marquis Johns is uh, I, I also talked about the notion of sovereignty in the context of a movement. Uh, so it was less so a lot of times when we're defining things, we are um, when we define things, it's hard for people to see it without referencing something else. Right. And what you end up doing is referencing uh, what people what's already established. And so people are just saying, oh, is it just a replication of what we have? Uh, and and a part of the definition is uh, is that it is a movement, and that uh, in some ways, where where some some would argue that where the Adventist Church got in trouble is when we move from being a movement to a organization to a church, and we've kind of delimited ourselves in that regard. Uh, one of the one of the questions that came up. Uh, earlier today um, um, uh, by some of our uh, audience is, is everyone on the panel uh, Seventh-day Adventist? That that question came up uh, uh, during the week, but uh, uh, could we, could we, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say, Pastor Souffrant, could you, could you, could you address this question? Yes, I'll address the question. Everybody on the panel is not Seventh-day Adventist because I am not Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> and um, can I yeah, also yeah, yeah, answer yeah, the question yeah, yes, of sovereignty yes, yes, while, yes. I, while I'm here? Perfect. So uh, <laughs> whew, here we go. <laughs> I'm, it, I'm, a, I'm just going to be honest because that's all I can be. If you don't own it, it's not yours. It's, it's, just, it's just that simple. And when we talk, see, Adventists have been convinced, brainwashed, hoodwinked, whatever the word is, to believe that their affiliation with this denomination is necessary for their salvation. They say things in theory, like, oh yeah, you know, you don't have to be Adventist to be saved. But when it comes time to put it in practice, oh, they have to be Adventist to be saved. And I think that's part of the problem. It's part of the reason why I think sovereignty is the answer, not just for black faces, because can I be honest, especially in Adventism? No, let me be honest. In Christianity, it has been black Ooh. faces promoting white agendas. So it's not about the face. I'm, it's not about your pigment. That's not that. It's about a mindset. When we talk about white supremacy, it's not about thinking white people are better than everybody else. It's about white culture, white ideas, white traditions being better than everybody else. And we just got done saying in this very conversation how Adventism came up in white America. And yet we're trying to act as if there's room in white America for black expression. I'm sorry. They will forever continue to shut down our expressions if they feel <laughs> our expressions are demonic. And so the energy to convince white people or white minded people that we're saved takes just as much energy to just build something of your own and cater to your own people. Say, hey, guys, we, and, and when I say this, I want I want to be extremely clear. I don't believe in separating or being sovereign because you're mm -hmm. angry or, or out of disgrunt or out of like, you know, negative energy. I'm saying it has been proven um, time after time that our own expressions are not acceptable. From GC session after GC session, we we just heard Pastor Moda saying drums just got into the church, and I know how black people are. You know, they give you an inch, we think they're about to give us a mile. But the truth is, they give you that bone so you can stop arguing and complaining. And so, I don't want to live the rest of my life. I don't want my children living the rest of their life trying to conform something that doesn't want to be conformed. I think if Adventists could be honest and say, "Hey, 
I love haystacks and I'm going to love haystacks whether I'm Adventist or not, right? I'm going to keep a Sabbath whether I'm Adventist or not. I'm going to follow the Messiah whether I'm Adventist or not. It frees us to actually say, let's build something where we can be authentically ourselves and know that God loves us because he loved me long before I knew what Adventism was. And I'm going to continue following him because when I got baptized, I didn't get baptized to become an Adventist. I got baptized to follow Jesus. And no denomination, my affiliation or lack thereof is going to get in the way of me following Jesus. You can't say like working alongside a denomination that doesn't like you. And it's no offense to you, doc, obviously, but it's just that that idea is, is, is ludicrous to me. Let's build something that we can pass down to our children, but let's also respect one another. Everybody's not going to be in the boat of sovereignty. I'm going to still love you as a brother and sister in Christ, just like how I love a, a Muslim in Christ or a Buddhist in Christ. I, those who have exemplified the image of God, those are my brothers and sisters, and I love them. And so, but it's easy for me to say because I'm not Adventist. I had to do the work of deprogramming, realizing God is not coming back for Adventists. He's coming back for his people. And Adventism, and let me share this story real quick, and then I'm done, right? When I was doing Bible work as a good old Adventist, because I was Adventist, Adventist at one point, right? I was doing Bible work as a good old Adventist. I went to a neighborhood, and uh, me, me and the person I was uh, doing Bible work with, we connected with this family deep. We got inside. She got all her grandkids around. We about to have Bible study, like 11 people. We're excited. They're excited. And we're about to pray. And she says, hold up, uh, what church are you affiliated with? And I named the local Adventist denomination that was literally around the corner. She said, oh, no, never mind. The uh, Seventh-day Adventists don't have the spirit of God. And when she said that, I was like, we just connected. Like, I don't, how does my affiliation all of a sudden mean I don't have the spirit? But that's when it hit me. She's not talking about me. She was never talking about me. She was talking about the church I was affiliated with. And that church did a piss poor job in letting the community know that they have the spirit of God in them. I refuse to limit my reach by staying affiliated with people who don't care about the world. All they care about is their own brand. I'm sorry. I'm done with limiting my, my gifts that God gave me to be uh, turned away. If someone turns me away because they don't like me, that's fine. If someone turns me away because they disagree with me, that's fine. But if they turn me away because I'm an Adventist, I don't have to be Adventist. God is bigger than Adventism, and that's where I decided to bring my ministry. So I think, uh, uh, Claudia, did you want to say something? And then I saw Jeremiah. Sure, I'd, I'd love to jump in here. Um, you know, I'm going to be that person today I fundamentally disagree with that. Um, so while I do agree that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it, because it is a white American-born religion, it does have um, colonialist practices and it is racist. I am the first person that will will, will come out and, and say that and declare that, that those, those things are realities. That said, um, the Sunday Adventist Church also, I believe, is colonialist because of its global practices. So because it does care about natural disasters in other countries and does care about poverty and other kinds of social issues internationally and has cared about such for decades, um, one cannot say that they are not engaged at some level. What I find to be problematic within the Seventh-day Adventist church system and structure is that they are structurally and systematically disengaged from conversations of race and racism globally. So whether that be whether with Nazi Germany during World War II, whether that be within South Africa and um, the apartheid, or that be right here in North America, the Seventh-day Adventist church has a poor history and a lack of engagement in dealing with the issues of race and racism. They also have a poor history of practicing a kind of evangelism that quite frankly, I heard uh, Pastor Mike Polite say this a few years ago, is a modern conception of colonialism. So that what you see is they do go to other countries, particularly brown countries, particularly 
uh, poor countries and impose upon them European white American yeah. modes of spiritual practice. And so you must engage in Adventism in this particular way. They then demonize other kinds of engage of spiritual engagement. So that when we have conversations about decolonizing the Adventist mind, let's even just take the black off of it. If we're going to decolonize the Adventist mind, what we're saying is that we're trying to get the global Seventh-day Adventist church to be open to a kind of Adventist engagement that is not specific to a white American or white European practice of the religion, all right? That said, um, I also think that we need to deal with the fact that the previous conversation, this conversation and the conversation to come has not one African thinker, African immigrant on it. Oftentimes when we have these conversations about decolonizing the black mind and we speak about connecting to the continent, this is a very invisible continent that never gets a voice here in this country. And so if we're going to say that we want to reconnect to our African roots, then we must be willing to give our African brothers a voice in that conversation. If they cannot actually speak to how they are decolonizing themselves on the continent, and nor can they speak to how they are decolonizing themselves here in the States, then the conversation that we are having is very imaginative and very futurist, but also very exclusive. And so when we have a conversation about sovereignty and you ask me, Claudia, uh, what are your thoughts about sovereignty? I'm not here for it, I'm gonna keep it 100,000. Uh, I think prior to coming, I was I was thinking of how to be like politically and open and, and I'm not here for it. I fundamentally agree with what uh, Dr. Ty said. I have zero energy that I'm willing to put towards the creation of an exclusively black Adventist denomination. That said, um, I'm not going to um, judge anybody who wants to put all their energy into that. If that's what you want to do, then that's what's up. This is where I venture off, though. This is why I venture off, because as far as I know, President Ted Wilson is not aware of what your local church pastor wants to do in the community. If you want to set up your church to be a polling place, it's not gonna end up on President Wilson's desk. If you want to be in the community and you want to work with the reentry of prisoners uh, or former inmates, President Wilson is not gonna be aware of that work. If you want to be in the community, you wanna do a voter registration job, President Wilson's not gonna be aware of that work. So any social justice work, I'm not even talking about charity because quite frankly, I personally believe the Seventh-day Adventist Church does a fantastic job with charity, uh, particularly international charity. Now I find that to be problematic, but if we're going to, to, to say that they do something or that they don't do something, let's say what they do and what they don't do. They do charity, internationally char international charity extremely well. What they don't do is justice. What they don't do is dealing with systems, structures, and powers that work to oppress people that, that goes back to that theology and doctrine of dominance that Jeremiah was talking about. So that when we have an issue within the black regional work around our uh, church's lack of social and community engagement, while there is a culture and a system within Adventism that frowns upon that kind of engagement, or they will come up with some kind of a theological explanation for why you should not engage in it. Nobody is at GC session voting about whether or not you can do something in the community. It's not on the docket, not in the agenda. Nobody is caring about it. So that my issue and my concern right now is much more focused on regional conference leadership. 70% of your tithe sits within the regional conference, okay? Now, does your tie dollar play for the GC session? Absolutely. Does it pay for NAD stuff? Absolutely. Does it pay for international ministries and missions? Absolutely. But 70% of that joint is at the regional conference level. It is with the, it is with the black leadership. 
so that the conversation is not so much about what white Adventists are not letting us do. The conversation should be around what our black regional conference leadership saying that we can and cannot do. And I also don't feel as though the black regional conference leadership are even saying that you cannot do certain things. Um, I do not see, hear, or experience any of these kinds of hard, absolute truths. And so my my encouragement for people, when I, when I think of decolonizing the black Adventist mind, sovereignty and moving in this direction, I think that we need to be thinking, how can I personally, at the lo as a local leader, whether that be lay or pastoral, how can I decolonize my own mind? How can I empower myself and my local community to do what I believe God has called me to do in the community and stop blaming white Adventism for stuff that they quite frankly aren't even aware we want to do, let alone are systematically impeding us from being able to do it. Well, I wanna follow up on that because uh, on our previous panel, uh, I asked a question about um, our, our Black Adventist uh, organs of, of disseminating uh, the message. So if Message Magazine, uh, Pine Forge Academy, Oakwood University, could you talk to the way in which these, because I know you work for a message, could you talk about the ways in which uh, our regional conference leaders could help with the decolon decolonization process of those who are Black Seventh Day Adventists. I guess I need a much better clarity on the question. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. So I'm saying that because they are because these uh, entities are are respected, right, within our denomination, right, amongst Black Seventh-day Adventists. And when you say entities, you mean like message. Uh, message Magazine, Pine Forge That's Academy, right. I'm saying these, these where you're saying these leaders, um, you know, these, we have Black leaders in these, in positions to manage these, uh, these entities, right? Uh -huh. uh, because they have influence, what are things that they can be doing to help the broader masses of blacks, uh, black Adventists decolonize their mind. Do you get that? Does that make sense? A bit, but it's still a bit unclear, but I will try to answer as, as best as I understand. I, I don't think that it's anybody else's responsibility to, to decolonize your mind, but you. Um, so I'm not looking to Henry Fordham, president of Allegheny East Conference to help me facilitate a decolonizing of problematic Adventism. Um, that said, I do think that to your question about the various black entities or institutions that exist within the Seventh Day Adventist Church, like Message Magazine, like Breath of Life. I won't include Pine Forge because that's an educational institution. Pine Forge and Oakwood, that needs to be a conversation unto itself about how we do black Adventist education. So let's put that over there. That sits with President um, Leslie Pollard, um, and the individuals that that work at Pine Forge. In dealing with the various ministry or production-based ministries that are Black, I think that um, one way that we could de decolonize or one way that, that that leadership could help to decolonize is structurally, right? Mm -hmm. so, an, so an entity like Message Magazine is currently attached to an advent to structure yet does not receive the same kind of funding and resources that other Adventist magazines receive. This goes back to mm. Pastor Lawrence Souffrant's point about the mm. fact that this is a fundamentally racist structure that is constantly seeking to ensure the uh, longevity and ensure the success of magazines like Adventist Review, magazines like Ministry Magazine, Adventist World, Journey Magazine, magazines that you receive in your mailbox and you didn't even pay for a subscription, right? Stuff you actually don't even wanna read. Um, those individuals have full staffing. They uh, are salaried, employed individuals. 
Um, that is not the case for Message Magazine. I'm the online content manager for Message Magazine and in full transparent, transparency, that is a contract position. So um, that is not a full, I'm doing full-time work, but I'm not being paid a full-time check, right? So that when we talk about um, how can we aid our own ministries and our own systems, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that goes to, you know, how can the regional conference presidents support some of our own mis missions and ministries? That said, I also am aware that they are in conversations and are already working the structural systems out for something like a message magazine and for a breath of life. Right. So they are Somebody all said pay that hashtag pay that woman. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's Dr. Tiffany Luella. So when we are, so when we're, so when we're talking about this, right, on the one hand, we need to be aware of the fact that the regional conference leadership currently is at work revamping their system and structure for the support of our predominantly black ministries within the church. All right. And so I think that that's a work that they can and, and, and should continue to do. But I want to go back to this because I feel like the underlying point is about sovereignty is dealing with local churches and local individuals being able to do the kind of social community work they desire to do. And my, my perspective, my opinion mm -hmm. is that um, you have uh, you do not have an outright barrier to the kind of ministry that you want to do. You might not have the resources, right? So maybe the conversation needs to be, how can our regional conference uh, leadership restructure our tithe allocation and set up a specific budget for local churches to be able to do this kind of work, right? Rather than us seeking to get uh, grants from secular institutions and entities. Why is it that local churches cannot write to the regional conference and say, I want to do X, Y, Z in my local church. I need a $10,000 grant. Why does that, why is there not an office and a budget that is available for the, those kinds of funds to be allocated to local churches and pastors? That I think is what our conversation should be about. How can we reframe and restructure what already is a black independent Adventist ministry, while it is a subset of the, of the global Adventist church, is already an independent black Adventist ministry that simply needs a much more effective structure. Its current mode of operation administrati administratively, logistically, is not working for our local pastors, for our lay people, for our ministers, and for our communities. So how can we revamp our regional conferences so that they work to the benefit of the visions and the goals and the objectives that we have for our communities? Thank you. Thank you for for that perspective. Uh, Dr. Ty, I, I need to go to Jeremiah first. Uh, however, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let Jeremiah go first. Um, first of all, I want to say that I think we need to understand that as far as bringing someone African on, they're going through the same struggle. The the brother who, who was pushing decolonization on the in African Adventism, they kicked him out of the church. The one who was pushing it the most, they kicked him out of the church. Oh, yeah, that's that. yeah, He yeah, can't yeah. even yep. preach in SDA churches anymore. So they're going yep. through their own struggle there. And they're probably actually a couple of steps ahead of us, but not yep. too far. Um, so even just bringing someone African on won't be enough. It needs to be somebody who who is in the struggle for decolonization on the continent. Uh, but um, I also, I, 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 think, I think it needs to... I think we need to understand that like this is not an either or like it's not this idea mm -hmm. of sovereignty is not an either or like we have we have independent ministries like Amazing Facts and 3ABM who are putting out mm -hmm. racist dog whistles like Russell Wilson throws footballs. I mean, yeah. like like and they're independent SDA ministries who work alongside the church. There's no yep. reason why people like Pastor Safran can't can't raise up independent ministries that work alongside the church. We need to have our ministries to do that. But even more importantly, like I, I, I'm going to say something prophetic for the SDA church as a whole. Hmm. Like the new generation, Generation X, and I'm starting to feel old and I'm, I'm like a young Xer. But Generation X on down, 
Mm-hmm. They got the internet. They got all kinds of information they want. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church needs to realize that this movement for indigenization, this, 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 room, this movement for decolonization is not going away. And, and it is a problem when, SD, when the SDA president and his cronies and even a brother was up there with them dressing up like plantation owners um, at, at annual council. Like stuff like that is a problem. It's a problem. Well, and, 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 I, and I think that we need to understand that people are going to do this. Like it's going to happen. Yeah. People are going to indigenize. People are going to decolonize. And the SDA church, it's very structured is is built in a way that will never allow the regional conferences to fully be what they be what they could be. It will never okay. allow things to people to fully decolonize themselves. What we need to do, this is a prophetic word for the Seventh Day Adventist Church. You got to change your structure or die. Bottom line, because the, even the prophetess Ellen White said that the power should be at the union level. Most of the power should be at the union level. Instead of at the GC, where it can create uh, uniformity. And if we put the power back at the union level, the Southern Union can come in and say, look, our, our people um, need this. You know, the, the, the regional conferences could, could create a union and boost up Ma- Message Magazine. You know, those type of things could happen. If we transition the power from the top back to where it belongs, then 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 the SDA church can look to exist in the future. Otherwise, what you're going to have is you're going to have a mass exodus to independent ministries that, that are meeting the needs of justice, that are meeting the needs of the community, that, that are not tolerating a uh, 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 dog whistle such as dressing up like plantation owners, uh, that, that will not tolerate things like disallowing uh, women to to be to be ordained and having this 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 uh, misogynistic glass ceiling across the entire globe like there's generations like three or four generations that are not going to put up with that and unless we make a, a systemic structural change to allow different regions this uh, place and space as, as as dr douglas talked about earlier unless we allow space and place to dictate how people express their Seventh Day Adventism, it's going to bring the entire structure down, and, and, and so that I think this idea of sovereignty is, is yeah. it, it, it has to it has to be something that is embraced by the world church, understood that this is not an if, like this is going to happen, it, it, and it's not just with an Adventism. People all over the world are starting to decolonize and indigenize. And, and, and so if, if we don't get ahead of this thing and become part of the movement, because really, look, and, and I'll say this and I'll get out the way. But like we talk about the three angels movement, come out of her, my people. Like if we're really going to preach about coming out of Babylon, why don't we identify who Babylon is? Uh, it's white supremacy it. and really come oh, out of it. her. That's like, let's really that's come. It. Let's really let's let's come out of her while we're preaching for people to come out of her. Yeah. Well, let me let me say this. Um, one of the things that. Uh, um, that I've noticed and I've heard people say is that essentially we don't even hear about Generation X anymore, uh, Patrick Sapola. We we essentially have said, oh, that's a lost generation. And so now you hear millennial, 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 millennial. So I'm uh, so I'm on the the uh, so I'm an X annual as they as they call I'm it. A, so I'm, I'm right in there, too, right man. in that in that middle. And so I think there I think this call for sovereignty a uh, sweet spot is this uh, disinfe- disaffected group that is probably not coming back to an organized structure such this, the organized structure of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. So even mm-hmm. if you restructured the uh, the Adventist uh, Church, that may not. <laughs> there are so many tenets that that uh, some people don't agree with, and I think Pastor Zufrant kind of talked about that on Wednesday. There are various tenets that people don't believe don't necessarily agree with within our church just to restructure it does not change some of those but some of those challenges it does to some degree because what the gc does is gc creates uniformity you know when we developed the 28 month well it was 27 at the time fundamental belief there was a lot of pushback on that originally because it created a dogma that 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 created uniformity within the church um i praise god that my my conference officials have been very supportive 
of my my desire to 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 research these things and even employ some of them in my life. I, I praise God that I work for the regional work because I don't think that would happen in the state work and I don't think it would happen in some regional conferences. But uh, but um, the thing is, is if we get rid of this top down structure, Dr. Freeman, where where we have to have uniformity in belief and culture and in practice, if we get rid of that, then you're able to localize things in which people can begin to express their Seventh-day Adventism, not in such a yeah. uniform way, but they can express their Seventh-day Adventism in the in a variety of ways in which mm -hmm. God created us to express mm -hmm. our Seventh-day Adventism. Yeah. Now, I'm Doug, sorry, Dr. Doc. Douglas was going to go before you. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to uh, sure, go Pastor uh, Sufran. Go for it. It's good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll, I'm going to be extremely quick because what we're doing now is redefining Adventism, which I think is okay. But when, when I talk about the need for sovereignty is when we redefine that, okay, when you're dealing with organizations, by default, you have to deal with the masses. What does the overall group want, right? And what that does, by default, it creates marginalized groups. In Adventist ideology, if you're in the margins, if you're not a part of what the majority has said, which is really... Christian practice and ideology, if you're not a part of what the majority says, you are lost. That is Adventist ideology. Even the remnant doctrine, and I don't want to I don't want to discuss doctrine because we're talking about decolonizing the mind. But to make the point, I, I just want to say that, but to make the point, even with the remnant doctrine, the remnant doctrine is crafted in a way that says you have a limited time to choose to be a part of the remnant. And if when that time runs out, you're not a part of the remnant, you are lost. And so, so at some point, we have to realize that that is a false doctrine when we compare it to who Christ is, in that the only thing that determines your salvation is Christ. And so sovereignty is about being able to be free. To, because when we, when we break it all down, what does it mean to be Adventist? And what is this Adventism we're trying to express? I know for me, growing up, I thought Adventism was about expressing Jesus. But as I got older, I realized, no, Adventism is not about expressing Jesus. Why do I still fellowship with Adventists? Because we, as Black Adventists, created a culture that I enjoy. I love haystacks. I love Vespers. You know, I, I love these things that are, you know, Adventists. Like, you don't, like... Outside of Adventism, haystacks are nothing but nachos, right? But we call them haystacks, whatever. I enjoy that. <laughs> I enjoy being able to, a taco salad, right? Exactly. I, I enjoy being able to go to a potluck and have theological discussion with people where we could be heated in the discussion and end the discussion with, well, you know, at the end of the day, God is love. And we're all like, yeah, we hug and we sing a song and we pray to close the Sabbath. I love that stuff. But outside of that, when we're talking about who God is, who we are in Christ, there are some things in Adventism that a lot of us fundamentally disagree with. And I don't know if we have time to explore what is Adventist. I think we can avoid all of that exploration and say, who are you in the most high? And create something or join something that best aligns with who you are in God, which is very much what the indigenous people have done. They had base understandings, but even each family would have their own traditions that represent who they were in relation to the community and who they were in relation to the most high. Yeah, I, I got a. Uh, I appreciate you sharing, uh, Pastor Safran. I got a, a message from someone who I think maybe having similar sentiments. They say people are having a problem calling themselves Adventists. This is a text. Uh, when the head of our denomination are fine with social, uh, with not talking about social justice, and they don't care about uh, uh, police killings, they support and uh, and the races. They no longer want people no longer want to be a part of our organization. That's that's a sentiment that's out there. I I. I and, I, and I'm sensitive to this reality as someone who is an advocate um, and, and, and you know engaged in activism as well. Uh, I, at the same time, I have not um, outsourced like my identity to any organization. So like when people like say the organize, you know, what does it mean to be Adventist? Like who, who gets to determine that? Like I feel like I get to also live out my uh, my Adventist experience, and, and let, me, let me also clarify, I, so don't, I don't run around calling myself Adventist. I run myself, I, I say I'm a Christian um, who is a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church. I, let me use this metaphor. I'm a sports guy, so I love football. 
you all call it soccer. Some of our American <laughs> audience, right? Uh, I love football. I'm a, I'm a supporter of Liverpool, and we just won the championship. So for those who are out there who you had to put football, that out there, right? I had to put yeah, that out okay, there, right? right. Um, <laughs> but but my love for football is not limited to just the Premiership, like that particular league, you know, or, or basketball. It's not just about the NBA. If you love the game, whatever it is, basketball, football, then your engagement with it can happen in different ways and in different spaces. It can be watching LeBron, but it can also be hooping in your backyard, right? And so I feel like sometimes we outsource our love for God to the organization. And we, and again, you know, we were talking about decolonization. I appreciate what Pastor Claudia said in that we need to think about what does that mean for us and the institutions for, uh, in which we have agency. So for me, that looked like apologizing to some of the young people who were at my the school I taught at, an Adventist school, uh, where they their hair was cut um, in order to be a part of the school. Like they, they had hair that was too long or, you know, it, it, it had to be cut off. So you had young brothers who had moved to, our, to Bermuda and now they're told their braids have to come off and off for them to be like a part of the school. And I was a teacher. I didn't tell them to do that. Um, but I was a part of a system. And at the time in my decolonization process, I didn't really see it as something I needed to advocate against. But five years, 10 years later, as a Christian who cares about the salvation of a person who, may, who was made to feel like his salvation was tied to a hair decision. And, 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 and his hair was great, ultimately, with the dreads or with whatever. Shout out, <laughs> Pastor Safuna, right? But I had the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. And, and I think that's what we need to be calling uh, our leaders and our, even our denomination and those of us who are part of conversations to engage with people to do, to actually go back to the place where the, the infringement happened. And I think we also need to consider in our, our, our sort of reflection that, you know, you, you mentioned sort of uh, the separation of, uh, we almost, we, I think we, like, we, we almost feel like these conversations are not theological, but they, they are. Like our, our study of God, our understanding of who God is, has been infringed upon. That's why I talk about epistemic violence to the extent that we think somehow culture is disconnected from theology. When we have been told this is what it has to look like, and so we can't even imagine that God actually loves us um, the way he created us. I'll just say this as I transition. Um, I took a class uh, in um, on the doc. Uh, the, I think it's the doctrine of the sanctuary, and I was struggling with the final assignment, trying to figure out why. You know, what would be relevant, right? As I went through an entire course, and I have like four or five generations of Adventists in my family. I just asked a simple question to my family, like, "What does the doctrine of salvation mean to you? Like, what what's the value of of of, of the of the sanctuary message?" And from like. Uh, you know, the, the 80 year olds all the way down to the eight year olds, like nobody got it for the most part. Right. Uh, but my takeaway from the course, which was very, two very simple principles. One was that the Garden of Eden was actually the first earthly sanctuary uh, was one that, that, that shifted something in my brain. Because when I think about the Garden of Eden as being in Africa, that means that, you know, people of color, right, when we were first created, like the very first sanctuary, when we think about worship, was actually a space and there was one a, a, a black space or, or a space of color, right? And, and, and God wanted us to be with him. So the other piece was like God wants to actually be physically present. Like the sanctuary is actually a physical location. And it's actually a place where he wants us in our, in to in our totality. And so that shifted something for me. That went from con candelabras and all the other pieces that my family members were struggling with. And I said, well, consider this. Like if you thought about the sanctuary doctrine as a reality that God wants to be present with you in, in all of how he created you, how would that shift your thinking? about uh, not just the message, but also the God of the message. And it did something for, for them as well as we began to simplify and make practical things that in our churches, most people don't even get, but they feel like I have to do it or understand it to even be a part of a structure. And so again, I'm not gonna outsource. I think we have to begin to earn some of this stuff for ourselves, create our own, um, but I mean, if you feel like you have the time to, to, to shift the whole structure and whatever, that's, that's fine. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not mad at those who feel that that's their call. But I also feel like we have to create systems and structures of healing for ourselves. And that cannot be given or outsourced just to the denominational structure any longer. All right, Pastor, we want to make sure that we get Pastor uh, Moda in here. Uh, and uh, we've gone past our, our two-hour two mark. Uh, is everyone good? I'm just making, I'm making sure everybody's still good. All right, pa Pastor Michelle. So I laughed, Pastor uh, Dr. Ty, when you said um, the Garden of Eden being in a black uh, 
in Africa. I laughed and I'll explain why. So I talked about it yesterday with, with Dr. Sidney and I was telling him that I remember as a kid and we're talking about the, colon the colonization of our minds, right? As a child, I remember watching a creation video story. And I remember that the person knelt down in the ground in the sand and they shaped out this creature for Adam and Eve in these beautiful brownish reddish sands. But when God breathes his spirit into this Adam, he awakens a white creature. And I, I never forgot that image. It was so vivid in my mind because as a child, I was being indoctrinated to believe that when God is present, white is present. As a child, I was uh, fashioned to believe that white worship was God's worship. As a child, I was fashioned, even in my black school, because I went to a school that was mostly composed of Haitians and Jamaicans and Bermudians and Bahamians in Miami. And when I was in school, I was mistreated by my black brothers and sisters because they said, well, you're Hispanic, you're an imposter. And I, and I, I wanted to go back to what Claudia said a little bit ago. She said that we needed to bring Africans into this conversation. And, and I hear you, what you were trying to say, Pastor Sapolin, but I think that what she was trying to hint at, and I'm not trying to speak for you, Claudia, so you can say what you need to, but what I was trying to say, it's, it's the epitome of what happens to women in our church where they are talked about, but never talked to. We, we are we are talked about in rooms behind closed doors where people want to make decisions about how we do ministry. They want to make decisions as to how we even operate after getting divorced, how we operate uh, in churches where they are spread out and all of these conversations about us, but very seldom with us. And I think that if we are decolonizing our minds. Part of that is also understanding that, yes, this structure was created by white people to benefit white people. You have to say it because that's the reality of what it is. But I don't I want to caution against this idea of burn it down and, and just, you know, start over. You know, I no shade to anyone who leaves the Adventist church. Go on with your business. God has called all of us to different walks of life. And I believe that he empowers us to make those decisions. I don't think that we have a heaven or hell to put people in. I mean, I don't have that power. And if anybody does, please let me know how you came to that power. However, I will say that the Adventist church, theologically where it stands, the doctrines on which it was founded on were very sound biblical doctrines. And if you believe in the doctrine, but you do not like the practice, which we can agree, I think, uh, unanimously, that the practice of Adventism has been a whitewashed version of of what God accepts is beautiful. And we've even gotten to the place in our Adventist elitism to look at things like Kanye's version of Jesus is King or Beyonce's video of Black is King. And we criticize and we condemn and we destroy people that are talking about our culture because we've been taught to view it from demonic eyes. I get it. And I completely agree that there needs to be some major restructuring because the millennials have become completely intolerant of racism. They've become completely intolerant of injustices. They have become completely intolerant with even the way that we treat gays, the way that we treat women, the way that we treat people with disabilities in our churches, it, it, the, the, the stigma of mental health in our churches. We, these should not be conversations that we are still having. The conversation should be moving us towards where we need to go. And I look forward to, you know, hearing even from your next panel, Dr. Freeman, and and from, you know, Claudia, I, I listen to a lot of Claudia's stuff and, and I love that she's so gung-ho about criminal justice reform and all these things because that's what's necessary right now. Those things are affecting the way that we live our lives as blacks in the place that we live. We do not live on pay on streets of gold yet. We do not live in a mansion in the sky. We live here where we're being shot down 
in the streets where we're being persecuted and prosecuted and treated unfairly and told, you know, being our rights to vote are being removed. And I'm saying all that to say decolonization is a personal work. You have to take the time to educate yourself about where you are, where you were, what you were raised to think is right or wrong and struggle with that. God is big enough to take your disappointment. He's big enough to take your questions and he's big enough to answer them for himself. He doesn't need any of us to be his bullies. He doesn't need any of us to advocate for him in that way. He's got it. He's grown and he can do it for himself. Our jobs is to, to remove these structures of holiness that we've created in our minds, remove these structures, these barriers of, of gender roles and, and, and these issues that are constantly and systemically holding us in an oppressive state. That's what our job is right now. If we're going to move forward from this conversation, I believe it's very important to understand that even to have sovereignty or even to have something that works for you, you need to know who you are. And if you don't know who that is, these conversations aren't going to help you. And no, no, no one will be able to help you until you come to the reality face to face with who you are, yeah. where so, your identity is. So there's, there's, is. Uh, give me a second, uh, Dr. Tai. Uh, so there's, there's two things I want to, uh, to mention. Thank you so much, Dr. Moda, for what you, what you shared. Um, one, I just want to make clear uh, in this, this discussion about sovereignty. There's no one t saying that we're trying to burn things down. So let's, uh, I just want, want that to be clear uh, because uh, one, one of the things that I posted online maybe a couple of weeks ago is that we have to be careful about the language in which we present the other side of a, uh, of a position. So sometimes we can, so just as we wouldn't want to call somebody a sellout for, for staying in the system, uh, those that are not not um, necessarily are exploring other points, we uh, other ways of doing things. Uh, we don't want to use language that would um, could be perceived as disparaging uh, that point of view. I also uh, want uh, there's uh, Stanley James uh, brought up a question uh, that I did not. I don't think I was able to do at the beginning of this conversation but i i think is really important uh to to address is uh what is the biblical basis of these arguments and kind of this whole notion of decolonizing uh the black of in his mind and so um uh, there are two texts in which uh i've grounded this work in or i've drawn inspiration uh related to this so uh, if uh, you, you guys may want to put it uh, in the chat or write these two texts down, but use, uh, most of you probably will be familiar with them. Uh, the first text is Philippians uh, 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Uh, the second text is Romans uh, chapter 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. So those are the, those are kind of the basis for this whole conversation of how are we decolonizing our mind. We're, we're renewing our mind as God would have us to. Uh, so, uh, pastor Ty, uh, he's, he's doctor and pastor. So, uh, we'll, pa uh, pastor, uh, Ty, could you please, uh, uh, share or share your comments. Just, I just had a quick thought. Uh, and shout out to uh, Dr. Stanley James. Uh, he's actually a Bermudian uh, scholar. He's a medical doctor and a theologian. He was one of the first people, uh, Pastor Sapone, you'd be interested to know, who actually pushed me around thinking about, um, you know, white supremacy, right, as the uh, as the final power that's coming down. Like we think about the lamb-like beast, and like we've always sort of focused on like the United States and Rome and the like. And so, shout out to uh, Dr. James for like helping me to even reimagine um, how we've been taught as it relates to you know what these last movements may look like, and I think that's important for a couple of reasons. I believe sometimes the frustration that we have um, in our work and our advocacy 
is because we don't often consider who the enemy is. Like, what are we really wrestling against? And I'm not just trying to like over spiritualize what we're saying we're wrestling against flesh and blood. Yes, yes, the enemy. But it's also specifically manis- manifested in particular ways. We've talked about white supremacy. And I think again, that's important for the audience, for those who are not familiar with that language. We're not just talk. We're not talking about people in hoods. Like, we're talking about the ethos of the people who wore who wear hoods. That's in the systems and structures. And so that also means, right, that. Um, uh, like we all have different roles to play as relates to the salvific work, the the sanctification uh, 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 process that people are engaging in across the diaspora, across the identities that we embrace. Um, that means that our white brothers and sisters have a lot of work to do as well. Like I believe that they struggle to love their neighbors as themselves because of how the structure has been set up. Like so, some of us have a respo- have a not not responsibility necessarily, but a, may feel a calling to engage with folks in that space. There are others who have a calling to uh, uh, to start something different. There are others who may, you know what I'm saying? So I think we get frustrated because we feel like it has to look this particular way. Yeah. But I've actually enjoyed in this season, in this COVID context, where we've, we've got a chance to pull back from like having to produce programs every single week for people. <laughs> and like, Everyone's beginning to sort of reimagine what their time looks like, including enjoying the Sabbath and um, and then, you know, uh, creating podcasts or doing various things. But again, we have to do those things, understanding that this is a struggle that is bigger than us. And even Alan White, I want to ha- shout out, you know, sister, uh, uh, Pastor Lola Moore, who highlighted la- in the last panel, um, you know, how Alan White was sent to Australia when she began to talk about these things. Right. And so. This is not new. We're going to engage in this fight until the end um, because it's a stronghold and because it's a reflection of the dismantling of the United States. And the United States is not not just about a country. It's an ethos that came from Europe, but ultimately goes all the way back to the uh, ultimate enemy. And so uh, I think we need to begin to connect those dots. So when you think about, for example, critical race theory, which talks about the permanence of racism as a fundamental talent of critical race theory, CRT, which uh, the president has come up against, you know, recently. Yeah, can we even like, talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So critical race theory is uh, a, a, a theoretical framework that uh, uh, was started by a scholar, Derek Bow and others, uh, to get us to think about elements of uh, uh, and the experiences of uh, of living in uh, a racist context. And so there are key tenets. Like one of them is the permanence of racism. In other words, like we have to consider the fact that as black people, you know what I'm saying, like, like how and when you came into a space matters. And so uh, uh, before we could own property as black people, for example, we had to stop being property, right? And so that's a, a sh- something you have to think, when you think about that, that, that journey, that's different, right? And it's, so that also means for if you're fr- someone from the Caribbean or from the continent of Africa and you came to the United States on Delta, like your journey here was different than if your ancestors came under the bowels of a boat. Yeah. And so like how you see the space and the opportunity here, it could be very different based on how you came. So if you begin to ground what we're doing not just in uh, 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 like like you know some of the the theological convers- uh, elements of it, but also some of the realities of living in this sinful world that we are going to continue to wrestle against this. For a person who's listening, you want to be a part of change. You feel frustrated with the denomination and what has been done. Okay, like what does it look like to create a movement? And, and I believe that's what you're calling for, Dr. Freeman. That is suffering. That that is that makes demands that that causes us to think differently about where our money goes the interesting thing about bermuda for example you know we send a a, a lot of tithe you know to the atlantic union conference uh, uh, conference and uh uh, you know that I mean that, that like we don't, and Bermudians don't even get the the benefit of like the tax write off that you get in the U S and we sent it to organizations institutions that don't even necessarily serve our people we you know AUC was closed and yet we were still sending money to deal with the debt of that like so oh, what does it look like for a Bermudian in this space to begin to ask well how are we organizing our money and who says it has to go here and beginning to reimagine that's that's part of the sovereignty conversation so again I I, I want to emphasize the beauty and the breadth of diversity, diversifying our, our, our activism um, and maybe refocusing our energies to engage where you were called to do the work. Yeah, so uh, I see in the, uh, in the chat uh, the name of Joshua Mapongo. I'm not familiar uh, with that individual, but uh, it was in the context of someone that could speak to uh, the African uh, perspective of decolonizing um, the Black Adventist mind. And so um, um, I, 
we'll try to track that person down uh, as we're as we're expanding our network uh, in this in this work. Uh, he's a uh, he's a South African um, scholar who um, does this, and so I can put you in contact with some other South African pastors and other individuals, including him, um, that can speak very well to this and how they're having these conversations um, specifically in South Africa. Because what I don't want to do also is you know, like brush the whole continent either, you know, so it's like what Africa may be different, right? right? Like what they're talking about in South Africa is not what they're talking about in Nigeria. So, you know, we'll have to, you know, figure out, you know, who do we get in contact with and and how are they having these conversations across the continent? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeremiah, were you wanting to say something? All right. Well, uh, let's go to essentially our, our last question. Uh, recently, there were there have been suggestions made about next steps to decolonizing the Black Adventist mind beyond beyond having panels, right? Uh, one such suggestion was developing various curriculum for all ages. Uh, what might be other tangible ways that Black Adventists individually and collectively can move forward to decolonize our minds to positively advance our community? read and not just sda authors don't just read sda authors read you know dr freeman's put uh for forward a list i think it's important to read but also think it's important to um speak to people and uh hear people's experiences you know in my doctoral research sitting uh with with native american followers of the way um, and and engaging in their traditional ways, it it just it opened up my mind in a way I, I never would have imagined before. That going to um, Mexico, sitting with Mayas, and 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 hearing their experiences, you know, speaking with my my in laws from from West Africa, hearing their experiences, and just I really think it's important to to it's important to read, but it's also important to experience, to, to listen to other people's experiences and get to know individuals who've walked a different path. Um, and, and I think that opens your mind and, and that's the bottom line. Your mind has to, because if you go, okay, I'm going to decolonize, you know, okay, well, what does that, what does that even mean? You know, you, you have to literally change your thinking because we're taught to think from a, a Western mindset that, that, puts a dichotomy between the, the, the day-to-day and the spiritual. And you have to change your, your perspective of thinking before you can even fully embark on the process of decolonization. And I, and I think that, that, that a lot of these books that, that Dr. Freeman put forward will help in that process. But I also think it's more important to, to um, get to know the experiences of others. Others that well. may have something to share on that line. Man, so one of the things that I did, I'd say maybe a few years ago now, is I made a, a a slight shift, but it was a very significant shift for me in that I identify first as Christian and secondly as Adventist. Dr. Ty spoke to this um, a little earlier as well. So um, I made my Adventism what it was, a religion and not a cultural identifying marker. And I think that the moment that you make that intellectual shift, I think that you begin one to engage with Adventism differently, but then you also begin to kind of see how the church is functioning and operating um, differently as well. Because I think that one thing that does need to be said, and uh, Pastor Damian Chandler made this comment um, in the chat, um, is that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not the only church that's trying to figure out how to do this, right? I think that the problem that we must really deal with is that religion as a whole, organized religion as a whole, particularly white American organized religion is problematic. <laughs> it is rooted and grounded in colonialism. So that, we, you know, I don't want us to um, share this in such a way that makes viewers feel like, man, the issue is Adventism and the Baptists aren't talking about it. Oh, the yeah, Baptists yeah. are talking about it. The Methodists are talking about it. The Episcopalians are talking about it. Um, and so this is a conversation that we are all trying to understand. How can we as individuals who believe in Jesus Christ and who are subscribed and submitted to an organized religion, an organized denomination, how can we 
decolonize ourselves from the various structures so that like we've been talking about this whole afternoon, we can engage in our spirituality in nuanced, freeing, powerful ways that grant us an intimacy with God that we have not yet to experience because um, the, the names of God that we've been given have been given to us from, from oppressors. And so I think that, um, you know, Sydney and I, we, we talked about this, you know, earlier in the week, you know, I think that the, there's so much power in language. Um, there is so much power yeah. in being able to, um, name God for yourself, um, to have an experience with God that is unique to you and your culture. You know, I'm going to be real. You know, we're talking about blackness. Blackness one is not a monolith, but my blackness is so mixed and muddled, man. It is not pure. Uh, you know, we've, we've always had conversations about, you know, well, if you're a black American, you know, you're a pure black American. Like, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> that's not possible. <laughs> like, you know, and so my blood has African blood running through it. My blood has Jewish blood running through it. My blood has Native American blood running through it. And so that means that my blackness is an amalgamation, which means that decolonizing the mind means how can we get back to the origin of humanity? How can we get back to the origin that we all in our humanity bear the very image of God so that I, uh, you know, as Ty always talks about, man, I'm a border crosser. How can we really become border crossers and acknowledge that in our inherent being, we are border crossers. Colonialism is what set up borders and barriers and, and, and boundaries and, and all of that. And what we're trying to say is let's decentralize our cultures. Let's decentralize our religion. Let's decentralize our theology. And in doing that, be embracing of all peoples, all languages, all ideas, all modes of expression. One of the things that I'm, you know, some of the things I'm reading right now, since we're talking about practical stuff, I am excited because I'm about to get into some Japanese theology, guys. Listen, I am about as pro-black as they come, but quite frankly, I don't want to read about any more black theology. I've read all of James Cone. I've read D Dolores Williams. I've done that track. And I encourage all of you to do that. I think that you've got to really begin to get outside of black Adventism and into a black theological expression and understanding that is not Adventist. So I want you to read all those. But I also don't want you to be so restricted to yourself that you don't read Japanese theologians, right? Read Native American theologians, read Mexican theologians. And, and what I'm learning, back to my original point, is that I'm getting a language from them that I, that I don't have access to because I'm not Japanese. Mm -hmm. I'm getting, I get a language from Richard Twiss that I don't have access to because I'm not connected to Native American communities who follow the way. And the language that he uses in, in, in calling God, you know, the creator and the great spirit, you know, and, 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 and uh, new names for the Holy Spirit, new names for God the Father. When you open yourself up to that kind of stuff, you immediately put yourself in the position and presence of God in a new way. And I think that that's what decolonizing the mind is about. It's about how can I shed off all of this stuff so that I can put myself into a position and presence of God that I have not, that I've not experienced and I don't have access to um, maybe because of my culture, my denomination, yay, maybe even my ethnicity. Um, and so just, just, just like Jeremiah said, Read. <laughs> um, that's that. That's the entry point, friends. Read and have conversations with people um, that are outside of your boundaries. I, I having the opportunity recently to speak in South Africa a few times. I am talking to my new South African friends on a whole new level, and they are opening my mind to how Adventism operates out there and what the kind of ministry they're doing down there, how they're breaking boundaries and doing things down there. And 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 I'm excited for them to put me in contact with people in Kenya and people in Rwanda that I can have conversations with about this stuff. Because just like we're saying, um, it, it, it's about how can we 
how can we just shed the barriers? How can we share the borders and 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 cross like like Ty, Ty's book talks about? Man, that that's that's what decolonization is about. It's about the the reconnection of the globe. So if, we're gonna, if I, so if we're I gonna, it, we're, we're gonna um, take the next few comments. I see Doc, Dr. Ty wanted to speak, uh, Pastor Sapolin and Pastor Sufran. Um, we'll take those take those com comments saying if Pastor Moda wants to say something. And then we'll do our last little kind of round robin where where you guys will will take one minute just to say, you know, kind of a summary of what you want to leave with the people. So uh, just be thinking about that as as we go on. So I'll go with uh, uh, Dr. Ty, then uh, past, Pastor uh, Sapolin, then Pastor Soufran, and then we'll uh, uh, Pastor Moda and then we'll uh, come up with our, our last one minute. Uh, Yeah, I would just I love to build on what was just shared um, that, you know, this is a really powerful moment in uh, Earth's history. And you know, let's not get lost in the sauce like like you, we it's a privilege to be alive right now, to be a part of this. Like this is amazing. Um, you know, when you think about it like uh, and I love in my work, you know, as I teach about anti-racism and and white supremacy, typically in white spaces as a professor and the like, like I you know, these these are new conversations. And sometimes you get more resistance in the church. Like we're not really willing to talk about. So this is a beautiful time that we're talking about them. But don't let the conversation, even the resistance that we get discourage you. Right. Like this is a part of the struggle um, in my work. I typically take people back you know, to the reality that like there really is one race, the human race. And, you know, that's where it started, Adam and Eve. And yet when you look at the, the, the division, it's a reflection of the enemy. Right. And you see, you know, that that that, that there's tensions that that's that's sin. Right. It's, it's ugly and it, and it should disgust us. And and I think the journey of, of reconciliation and, and and sharing the beauty and diversity of how God created us is a part of that to that you know let's 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 look at it right i mean the last time folks were really able to connect in this way was like at the tower of babel right um you know what i'm saying where everybody was coming together and and and, and the reason why god did what he did as relates to the languages thing was because they were worshiping a false god idolatry got in the way and so we even begin to tie the conversation together again as relates to white supremacy being idolatrous in that it makes another god supposedly higher than our god the true god then I believe we can recognize the power of this moment, you know, to be able to zoom across the world and to be able to reconnect like they were at the Tower of Bay, to have multiple ways to communicate with people from different languages. Like something yeah. is something special is happening. So like for me, if, if you could take something from this conversation as you relates to that, there's a, a, an amazing moment that's happened. Uh, and and again, you know, uh, colonialism and decolonization is often place based. And that includes like who you are, like how God created you. And where he placed you, like he, you were birthed in a particular place for a particular reason to particular people. And so I would encourage people, you know, to to do what I call embrace the BS, embrace the beautiful struggle, like the beautiful struggle of this work, of who you are, of like where you were created. Uh, and, 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 and I'll, be, I'll lead us to the final work, Dr. Freeman. Um, but there are examples of amazing people who inside and outside of our denomination, whether they were, they still are part of it in a traditional way or not, that are doing great work. There are models out there, right? And so folks who have also done it in problematic ways, we've talked about some of the organizations that have told us, you have to sing this way, or you have to do it this way or whatever. But there are also others. I think of my friend Eric Thomas and, and Jeremy Anderson, these guys mm -hmm. are doing amazing work across the globe, you know what I mean? In, in partnership but also sometimes outside of our structure like right. embrace the beauty of your struggle your struggle and where you were created and the skill sets that god gave you and don't be afraid to innovate this is a beautiful time um that god has brought us together again to be able to get to to, to see him face to face real soon wonderful pastor sapone um i just want to say that um I want all of us to remember that Jesus is God. Mm. Like he, he, Jesus is God. Like he's the most powerful being in the universe. He's creator. And I think sometimes we buy into the aspect of this theology of dominance that is fear, that we're afraid of things. You know, as you cross the borders, as you read different theologies, as you read uh, different traditions and cultures, don't be afraid. When I was going into the Mayan cave, that they believed was Hades. I wasn't afraid because I have Jesus. Like right. there, there's no evil spirit. There's no good spirit that, that can come against me because I have Jesus. 
And so I really think we need to, as don't be afraid to, in the process of decolonization, explore. Because Christ will lead you. He'll tell you, don't go there, do go there. If you go, he's going to protect you. So, so do away with, the, with the, 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 the spirit of fear. The Bible even tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear. And explore. And what you will find is Christ waiting for you. He was already there before you got there. Pastor Shufran? Yeah, so um, when dealing with other ways to decolonize the mind, I want to talk to some of the leaders um, just real quick and say to incorporate some practices that are wholesome, but maybe not European based. You know, as I said, how I lit my incense in the beginning, we had to bring clarity. I don't know why more churches aren't lighting incense. This is not to say every church needs to light incense, but I would I would challenge the leaders to say, if I was to light an incense today, if, if my church would have an issue with it, why would they have an issue? And then start tackling those things. Don't just light the incense and create like a frenzy, right? Because that will be irresponsible. But, <laughs> you know, consider if I lit this incense, will there be pushback? What would be the pushback? And then start challenging or, or start working on those things with those who you're called to pastor. Because at the end of the day, while decolonizing the mind is a personal work, absolutely, we're in community for a reason. And the African mindset wasn't individualistic. That's very American. The African mindset was, I I am you and you are me. We are, we are one, you know? And so uh, we have to consider our community and help sharp. I mean, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, right? So does one man sharpen another. So we want to consider where if 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 adventism cuz i i'm still not so that adventism wants to decolonize but if there are people who believe that adventism is ready to be decolonized then consider some of those practices that may be resistance though there's nothing wrong with them um you know uh different prayer positions. Oh, why not fast with the Muslims instead of, you know, calling them terrorists? You know, try these different things where you can open up and and you can't say everybody you know, anyway, I'm I'm going to get off that. I would say that my final thought would be uh <laughs> um to really to re to recognize that you are the temple of God. So this abstract idea of God is great for thought and discussion, but you have to also find God within. When he breathed, he breathed his spirit in us. Jesus says that we will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in us. I refer to the Holy Spirit as a she. I believe that's the feminine principle of God, but that's another conversation. Embrace the God within. Recognize that God is not as far as you think. That is that is a design for control because if God is far, then you have a reason to be afraid, Jeremiah, uh, Pastor, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Jeremiah. But if you recognize that where I go, there is also God, then what am I supposed to be afraid of? But I can't, I can't just walk in that if I have not yet experienced God within for myself. So get out of the emotionalism, the charismatic is, I love charismatic stuff, but at some point in your quiet hours, can you sense God here inside, not just around? Yeah. So I'm going to let uh, Pastor Moda have kind of the final concluding word as as far as these statements uh there was a question about some of the resources some of the books there were a lot of good resources that were mentioned uh, my wife put some of those in the comments in the chat uh, but uh, I would also encourage uh, those that are looking for those resources. They'll be on my Facebook page. Uh, so uh, if you go to Sydney, my professional faith, uh, Facebook page, um, Sydney Freeman Jr., if you go to that to that page, um, I will be uh, posting those resources. So I would encourage you to go like that page so you can access uh, that inform uh, links to those to those uh to those um those resources so pastor moda so i am i'm very very big on history uh, I think it's important to understand what has happened so that you can know what worked, why it didn't work, and how you can take that and implement it in the present so that you can have a future to look forward to. And, um, you know, in, in, in doing my research on my country and obviously on Haiti as well, because you have to do research on both to understand the country, um, 
believe it or not, Haiti would have probably been one of the most richest countries today, considering that it was the first black country to become, um, to, to release itself and become independent. However, they were stifled, not just by outside money coming in, but also a destruction from within. And so when I was saying earlier, burn it down, I wasn't talking about actual, like I was, um, I think it was taken a little bit out of context. I was referring to what happened in Haiti, where because of the systemic oppression from the French, they decided to remove everything that reminded them of slavery. And in so they ended up removing their highways, their systems of the machines that made the sugar, the plantation systems, they destroyed it. And they were afraid of the re of, of people coming back in and taking back over. So they spent money on so many things and people did come back in, but not in the way that they expected them to. They never made them slaves again in a physical way, but instead they took their money and they put them in debt and made them pay reparations. Think about that for a second. The enslaved paid reparations to those that oppressed them. So what I'm saying is as we are looking at decolonizing our minds, it's to not allow those types of things of oppressive past to repeat themselves in the present because we're going to be right here again in the future if we're if we don't see where we've been and set a path as to where to go in a very real way i believe that we need to create conversation spaces where we can just not just discuss what it looks like to decolonize but once you accept that we have all come from the one race. When you understand that Africa is our country of origin for everyone, then we can actually start having forward moving conversations, conversations that are not just going to tell us, hey, you're black, wake up. And I'm talking specifically to Hispanics, obviously, because this is something that we're still struggling with. Um, identity is a really big thing with us. And so this idea of, well, because I accept something, I'm automatically annihilating another part of myself. No, that's white man talk. That's stuff that they want you to believe. That's things that they use to oppress you systematically and systemically. And they create systems of oppression to continue to have those models in mind. So I really just want to push that it's necessary in order to decolonize. You said, how do we do it in a physical way? I think that your identity has to be something that you struggle with. Reading other people's things. I mean, I've gotten into reading Buddhism. I've gotten into reading... Um, Hinduism. And it's interesting how many similarities in terms of creator God and destructive God and, and all these gods that they serve that we serve in our three and they serve in their own ways. And it just makes you understand your religion more. It makes you understand why you believe Christianity over Hinduism or over Buddhism or over any of the other possible that are out there. We cannot act like we're the only people who inhabit the earth because we're not. Um, and so I believe that moving forward is reading, but it's also putting into practice what you are reading. It, if you see someone having conversations that are going to bring you back, help that person come forward or don't sit there at all. I think that sometimes we get so caught up like uh, Dr. Ty said, we get lost in the sauce of what people are saying and we get so caught up in trying to be diplomatic or trying to be politically correct or trying to be that we end up losing everything. So I think that now is a time for us to move forward. We need to create and we need to restructure, create new systems and restructure the ones that we are already in if we're going to stay in them, because the way that it's going, it's not going to last very long. Thank you so much for for giving that wrap up for us. Uh, I want our audience to uh, be aware of we've actually asked our speakers to change their name, their name tags under their their pictures uh, so that you would have access to reaching out to them via their uh, Instagram. Um, also, uh, I just want uh, you you may see something scrolling at the bottom of your of your screen there uh again i just want to remind you that <laughs> this is a, a self-supported ministry <clears throat> and uh if you if you agree that this is a worth worthwhile venture to have these conversations 
I would uh, invite you to uh, to make a donation uh, so we can continue to have these uh, these robust and um, excellent um, speakers come and to share uh, share and enlighten us regarding decolonizing our minds and uh, next moving towards a uh, black Adventist theology. Um, before before we end, I want to make sure. Uh, I want to make sure that I acknowledge again uh, 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 Kirk and um, Kirk Nugent and uh, Composition for their excellent job that they've done uh, today in facilitating the audiovisual for us. Um, and uh, again, my wife for uh, putting things in the chat and doing some other things to help us uh, in the background. I would also like to thank our panelists again, Dr. Ty Douglas, Ms. Claudia Allen, Pastor Lawrence Dufront, Pastor Michelle Moda, and Pastor Jeremiah Sapolin um, for, for the, what they've shared uh, on today. And so to close us out, I would ask uh, Pastor Dufront to uh, close us out with prayer. Sure, no problem. <sighs> To the most high God, we thank you once again for the breath, for the life, for the strength that you've given us all. We thank you, God, that you were indeed present in this conversation um, and you're already doing the work to help us experience the freedom that you promised. Uh, we know that you came to set the captives free and there are many of us who are still bound in our minds. Um, we're still captive in our emotions. We're still captive in our ideologies. And I'm so glad that it's your work to free us. So we submit ourselves to you with gratitude, knowing that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. She who the sun sets free is free indeed. So thank you, God, for doing that good work. Please uh, continue to, to bless us as we begin to go our separate ways. Help us to um, take that which is fruitful, not just say, ah, that was good, that was deep, but to apply it in uh, whatever influence we have, whatever um, authority we have, help us to truly make the necessary changes that the image of God may be restored here on earth, that we will indeed uh, represent the kingdom of God here on earth until your soon coming. We thank you. We love you. In the name of the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, again for all who are watching for your participation. Uh, please don't forget to like the Facebook page. Um, Sydney Freeman Jr. and sub subscribe to my YouTube page. I need 500, 500 uh, subscribers. I'm at uh, over 200, but we need 500. So please, uh, after this, please subscribe uh, so that you can get access to uh, some of the rich content that we have there. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. Blessings. Mm -hmm.